Um, we might get started, but at this stage, our speakers haven't arrived due to the traffic coming into the hospital, I think. Yes. So we might get started with um, Welcome to Country. So um, we've got Michael Illen here today, and he's going to do Welcome to Country for us. So um, actually, before we do that, who have we got in the video conference? We've got Thursday Island. Hello. Hello. Yeah, where is the other... Uh, so, who else have we got? We've got Charters Towers? Yep, we've got Wayne. Yeah? Is there anyone else out there? No? Okay. So, when you're saying, Cooktown's here. Oh, oh hello, Cooktown. <laughs> I thought there was a third person. Okay. So, um, Michael, do you want to come forward and do Welcome to Country for us, please? I want the dance. No. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, what a mully, we say. Say what a mully in my what a mully, yes. Um, I'd like to also make a special mention to um, all the men in the crowd today. <laughs> Not men. None. No. Oh. So you know why I'm here now, doing the welcome to country. I'm not some weirdo that's just come in and, you know. <laughs> I would like to welcome our constituents also on video link up there. Um, Hope Vale plays a special part of my, my heart my, uh, near Cooktown there. So uh, welcome to everyone up there in the Cape. Uh, let me welcome everyone uh, this morning to the Townsville Hospital Health Service. Uh, my name is Michael Illen. Um, and I work as the team leader within the Indigenous Health Service Group within the Liaison Unit. Let me acknowledge the great work that collectively we conduct in this Townsville Hospital Health Service to ensure health outcomes for all consumers we, that we conduct for our consumers that we all play important roles in this service delivery. And let us reflect and acknowledge this together. Let me welcome and acknowledge you to country, my traditional land. This land here is the Bindle land, where we meet today, where ceremonial rituals were performed, where our totems are identified, along with our rock art, sacred sites and sacred grounds, where the lands and seas and its formations has great significance to my people and my ancestors and our children. We, the Bindle people, and the traditional owners call our country Balgariwaja. The symbol for my people is the shooting star and that wherever the star felt meant that there was someone, our countrymen, in that direction who was in need of help. My friends, we don't own the land, the land owns us. And I pay my respects to my elders past, present and emerging. Let me acknowledge our neighbouring countrymen, the Walgarugaba peoples, the Torres Strait Islands and the South Sea Islander people who are heavily into, intertwined into Aboriginal culture through relationships and through marriage. And you, my non-Indigenous friends here today in this great country in which we need to all live and share and respect and great unity. Today we meet and congregate for this special occasion and speak to the theme in regards to breastfeeding study day. One of the greatest connections in life, a child to their mother. My mother, she lived in the days of many great hardships. And those hardships were often obscured by her love. I have no recollection of the deprivation that occurred. And yet the worry of the world weighed heavily upon my mother's heart and shoulders, but simply obscured by her love. With my hand on my heart, I call upon my ancestral spirits to oversee and guide your discussion topics today in good faith. And that you in this Townsville Hospital workforce gain greater knowledge and outcomes to further progress 
in the topics that you discuss and that my ancestors overlooked your stay on country and truly blessed the day ahead. Welcome to country and thank you everyone. Okay, so um, as our speakers haven't arrived, we might um, just sort of start off with some housekeeping. So, um, everyone, did everyone grab a program on the way in? Yep. So first I might welcome our lactation consultants and um, so everyone knows, where's Nikki gone? <laughs> she has. So I've got Karen from the nursery and our most recent um, team member to join us is Michelle. Michelle's come from Child Health and she's now working alongside Karen in the nursery and I'm Melinda, as ever, most people know me, and Nikki, who's just popped out. So if you have any questions or um, anything today, just ask one of us and we'll try and help you um, with that. Yeah. Yeah. So has everyone signed in? We've got some sign-in sheets there. So um, if your name's not down, just write it on at the bottom. We're going to hand out certificates this afternoon. If you do need to leave at any stage or you're going to, you know, just attending, attending a few sessions, just write down um, the times that you've been here or what time you're leaving. So um, housekeeping, morning tea is going to be in the foyer. We do have um, some morning tea provided. We've just asked if it, anyone can provide a gold coin donation just to sort of help um, fund that. It's okay if you don't have any money with you or, you know, you're still welcome to join us for morning tea. Uh, lunch, that um, we will stop at about 12.30 for lunch. This, uh... <laughs> so the um, auditorium is booked between 12.30 and 1.30, so we sort of have to leave um, around about then, so um, we'll have about an hour for lunch, which is good. Uh, toilets are located just across the corridor, so through the foyer and across the corridor. Uh, in the case of fire, there's two exits from this room, so just here. Um, and then I believe that we meet out in the um, out here in the garden, in the garden area. area. So we might just let our speakers get settled, and then we'll introduce them. Okay, now we might get started. So um, first off, I want to welcome our speakers today. So we have um, Adele from Brisbane, from Adela, and um, Christy's come up from Melbourne. So we've turned yeah. on the weather for them both, <laughs> and um, hope, hopefully you'll enjoy the weather. Um, so today, the program that we've got has been just, the content is still the same, but the order of the uh, sessions is just changed around a little bit just so it'll flow better. So the first one is um, Christy's going to do the value of human milk in the NICU. So um, I'd like to welcome Christy. Thank you. Thanks very much um, for the warm welcome. Um, I'm really, really excited to be here. I've actually never been to Townsville before and um, flying in yesterday um, I grew up in the Territory in Darwin and I couldn't believe how much like Darwin it is actually here. So I really feel at home here. So thank you very much for having me here. Um, so a little bit about my background. Um, I have worked in the NICU pretty much um, my whole nursing career. So the last 20 years I've been um, in the NICU. And um, about three issues ago I decided to become a lactation consultant and I always like to talk about this story before I do this presentation because this presentation really was the birth of me becoming a lactation consultant. We were admitting a really sick, um, unstable 23-weeker in the NICU and all hell was breaking loose, basically. Um, we were deciding whether the baby was going to be able to be put onto an oscillator. Was it too small? Were we going to use the sensor medics or were we going to use the um, Draga ventilator? what we were going to do, we were trying to get inotropes up, this baby was really unstable. And the lactation consultant came in to me and she said to me, has mum started expressing yet? And I just looked at her in that moment and I thought, what? 
what kind of question is that? <laughs> Honestly, like, can you not see what we're doing? But I knew this lactation consultant. I had worked with her for many, many years. I respected her. I knew that she was an educated woman. I knew that she also was NICU trained. I knew that she knew what was going on. So when I got home that night, I really reflected on myself, on my practice, and I thought, she must know something that I don't know. There's got to be something more. She wouldn't choose that moment to come and ask that question if it wasn't vitally important. Then I started learning. I started looking at um, human milk. And as I uncovered the value of human milk, it was like this whole new world opened up to me. And all my passions collided. So developmental care, mother-infant in um, mental health, um, education, they all collided together. And so I became a lactation consultant. And this presentation really is all about um, why human milk is so vital to our NICU babies. So I hope that um, by the end of the presentation that you understand a little bit more about what I learned during that process. Um, we're going to be focusing a little bit on um, protection of human milk in the NICU. We're going to be talking a lot about colostrum and then focusing on some components of human milk, oligosaccharides, hamlet and stem cells, and also talking about the impact that human milk has on neck. Now, is everybody happy if I stand here, or would you prefer... I am quite little, so um, can everybody see me OK and hear me OK? I am very quietly spoken, so if I do get soft, just raise your hand and um, let me know. Also, um, given the volume of people, we might wait um, till the end for questions, if that's OK. But if there's anything really pressing through the presentation, just feel free to um, pop your hand up and I'll, um, we can talk about that as we go. OK. So, of all the preventative interventions, optimal breastfeeding of infants under two years of age has the greatest potential impact on child survival. Term and preterm babies that are fed with human milk as soon as possible after birth have a six times greater chance of survival. This is what that lactation consultant was trying to achieve by asking whether mum had started expressing or not. I didn't know this. I didn't know that of all the things that we do in the NICU, breast milk is going to help these babies survive better than all these other medical interventions. Yes, they play a role, obviously. We need to ventilate, we need to stabilise, we need to do all those things. But if we're not providing human milk, six times greater chance of survival with these babies? That was mind-blowing for me. OK, so the evolution of um, human milk is really fascinating. And this comes from um, a researcher called Katie Hindi. I really encourage you to look at some of her work. Um, she does lots of TED Talks, um, really fascinating information. She's an um, anthropologist and um, she has a special um, interest in um, lactation. And her research talks about that 250 million years ago, or thereabouts, mammals for some reason or another started producing a milk or a secretion that was a milk-like substance. And the babies who ingested this milk-like substance, they were the ones that were more likely to survive. So they passed on that gene. Hello, good morning. <laughs> You're right, welcome. <laughs> and that gene was passed on. And over the next few million years, until where we've um, arrived at today, Human milk has been tailored and it's been changed to ensure the survival of our species. Now, human milk is species-specific or all milk is species-specific. So every mammal has a different kind of milk for their babies. So we want human milk for human babies. Now, we have no problems drinking milk from a cow. Um, but when we think about drinking human milk ourselves, I mean, that makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. I think, oh, I'm not sure that I could drink my own human milk, but I have no problems drinking cow's milk. So it's just what we've been programmed to, um, to think is okay. Anyway, I digress. Okay, so human milk today is still essential protect protection for us. It reduces the incidence, severity and risk of many, many diseases. Um, it reduces the risk of late onset sepsis, neck, now, is everybody here happy if I just use the, um, the acronyms? 
If you don't know what anything means, just feel free to pop your hand up and I'll explain it. Um, obesity. We have an obesity epidemic in the world, not just Australia. Millions and millions of people are obese. Millions of children are obese. Breastfeeding our babies is... There's research being conducted at the University of West, um, Western Australia, the Peter Hartman Lactation Group, that is suggesting that breast milk is playing a role in decreasing obesity. <coughs> Diarrhoea is the number two... Um, cause of death worldwide, providing breast milk to our babies, providing this milk reduces that, um, the amount of deaths of um, babies dying from diarrhoea. And then there's other things, retinopathy of prematurity, that are also reduced. Now, when babies, babies still do get sick with these illnesses, but when they do, if they are fed human milk, the occurrence of it is like, more likely to be shorter and, and less likely to be so severe. When preterm infants are not given human milk, they've got a 25% increased mortality post-discharge. Now, as a NICU parent, this is information I would want to know so I can make an informed decision. I want to know this information. 25% increased chance of dying after discharge. OK, so let's talk a little bit about colostrum and why it's so special. And it is absolutely special. It is medicine. We need to think of colostrum as medicine. It's very, very similar um, to amniotic um, fluid. It's actually more similar to amniotic fluid than it is um, mature milk. And amniotic fluid contains proteins, carbohydrates, lipids and urea, all of which aid in the growth of the fetus. But in the last trimester the intestinal mucosa under the influence of um, amniotic fluid is doubling, it's growing. Now, if we don't have this opportunity of growth for the preterm infant, what is happening to their gut? We'll talk a little bit about that um, in detail a little bit more. Okay. So, again, amniotic fluid is closer to um, in make than mature human milk. And the lower the gestation, the higher the concentration of protective factors. So our bodies somehow know that when we have a preterm birth, that we need to up the ante of the protective factors contained within our colostrum. It's pretty amazing. Also, the colostrum lasts longer in mothers of preterm infants. So those of you who are um, NICU nurses in the room, you may have noticed that when you're collecting um, milk from a mother, that the milk stays in the colostral phase for a lot longer. And that's because of the protective factors that are in the milk. The body knows that this needs to happen. It needs to provide this protection for longer. So again, we've got this fascinating um, result as a direct feedback from what's happening in the environment for what the mum is producing. We want to encourage mothers, all mothers, to provide colostrum, even if they're not planning to breastfeed. And this is one of those really tricky areas as a lactation consultant, because we need to be really, um, we, we, we need to be careful in the language that we use when we're talking to mothers. But if we explain to a mother that her milk is going to come in no matter what she does, because it's under the control of the hormone system, and Adele is going to talk about that a little bit more in the next presentation. But we're making colostrum from about the 16th week of pregnancy. The colostrum is there and her milk is going to come in anyway. If we counsel this mother and we let her know how important the colostrum is to her baby, she may choose to harvest her colostrum and give it to her baby. And then she might, that might have a knock-on effect. My gosh, I play a vital role here in the health and well-being of my, my premature baby. Given the right support, she may then go on to decide to continue giving and providing milk for that baby. And then we might have a situation where we've had a positive influence on the baby's long-term um, outcome. OK, so just touching on why we need to talk about colostrum as medicine rather than nutritional... And that's because it has it plays vital roles in um, the baby's first days. 
It's really, really jam-packed full of immunological components. So secretory IgA, lactoferrin, leukocytes, and epidermal growth factor, again, growing that intestinal mucosa. It also aids with the jun tight junction closure of the gut, and I'll talk about that in a moment. It's full of digestive en enzymes, so getting that gut ready to be able to absorb the mature milk. It increases the absorption of nutrients, and it improves gut motility. So when we have babies that have got um, feed intolerance, what's happening in the gut is that the food is sitting there and it's not being passed through the bowel, okay? Now, colostrum is going to aid in that. It acts as a bit of, in term babies, it acts as a um, laxative. It causes them to have their, um, their first stool, passes that um, stool through their body. It's the same in premature babies as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what it does in the gut. So in the first few days after the birth, we've got these... We've got these transcellular roots here and these paracellular roots. And this is a single layer in the gut. Okay, this is the, um, the villi of the gut here. That's what's pushing the food through. Now, these transcellular and paracellular roots, they are open and they are open for a reason. And that is to let the colostrum through with all the, the, the molecules that um, immunological components, the antibacterial components, the anti-parasitic um, components, they are large molecules. So what happens is, is the, the, the junctions are open so that the colostrum can let these large molecules through and then that can benefit the baby. But what they do after they come through, the colostrum washes over the gut, it enters, then these junctions are, are closed, okay? Now, that sets the baby up for good long-term gut health. If this doesn't occur, if these um, tight junctions aren't closed, what else are large... Um, 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 sorry. Um, what else are large molecules that can go through? Anybody? So we've got pathogenic bacteria that are also large molecules. Now, this system... It can't choose which comes through, okay? So if we don't have colostrum as the first feed, this situation doesn't happen. And then we've got to set up for these um, larger molecules, these pathogenic bacteria, from being able to enter the gut, okay? So really, really important that colostrum is able to wash over the gut and then the, clo the, the tight um, closure of these junctions occur. Now... Studies in animal experiments also show that mature milk does not have the same maturation on the gastrointestinal tract as colostrum, and formula introduced to the gastro gastrointestinal tract induce apoptosis, or cellular death, of the epithelial cells within six hours. Okay, so that's really alarming, okay? So the opposite to what colostrum is doing, if we introduce formula early to these vulnerable cohort of babies we may be actually doing harm. So, you know, I challenge you in your own practice, if we know this information, and this information's been around since 2006 this study was done, if we know this information, then what are we doing in our own practices? Now, in America, where litigation is high, we are now starting to see litigation around formula being used as first milk. Okay, so we have to be really careful in our practice what, what we do. <coughs> Studies in animals and infants also indicate that immature GI tract responds to the first enteral food with rapid increases in gut mass and surface area blood flow, motility, digestive capacity and nutrient absorption. And preterm neonates show comp uncompromised GI tract structure, function and immunology when fed diets other than mother's milk. Okay, so... Babies, are we putting them at risk? Possibly. Okay, early oral, oropharyngeal therapy. Has anybody heard of this term? Oral therapy, you might have heard it called. Basically what it is, is using colostrum with babies who are unable to feed. So we're often in the situation where um, a baby is too unstable or too small to be fed straight away. We can use the colostrum and paint the um, oral mucosa 
and they still, all the, thing, all the um, absorption still occurs through the mucosa. They're still getting the benefit of having, coloss of, of, as if they were having, um, being fed. We know that this is a safe practice. We know that it's tolerated by the tiniest of babies. And it has knock-on effects. We know through studies that these babies are more likely to toler tolerate oral feeds earlier. They're more likely to go home earlier as well. Just by doing oral therapy, it primes the gut. We've got that same um, closure of the tight junctions happening. And it provides a protective secretory IgA for our mucosal surfaces. So this is a really, really simple practice change. We're doing oral therapy anyway in, with the baby, so we're cleaning their mouths, we're getting mum and dads and partners involved. This is something that we can get the families involved in. This is something that they can own. Um, instead of using the water or whatever you're, you use in your um, unit, we can use the colostrum to clean their mouth and we're, we're having all these benefits on the baby. Okay, another really, really amazing thing about um, a breastfeeding mum is that when she's exposed to the environment that a baby is in, the um, pathogens are entering her system. They are, she's creating a targeted response, so immune response, and she's secreting that um, immune response in her breast milk and giving that to her baby. So it's a tailor-made medicine for her baby. Now, we used to have in the NICU, we would get mums to go away from their baby, be separated from their baby when they express. We want mums to be at the bedside. We want mums to be expressing if they can in skin-to-skin -skin contact. There's a, um, a medical practitioner in the USA who goes as far as to say is that should we be letting mums lick their baby twice a day um, for this process to happen? Now, I don't know if we need to go that far, but... You know, we are, we are animals and, you know, there may, oh, there may be a benefit there. Okay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the microbiota. You might have heard, um, um, you know, buzzwords about the microbiota recently. It seems to be the, the current trend at the moment to be talking about probiotics and the microbiota and that kind of thing. So the human microbiota, it comprises 1% to 3% of our total body mass. So a large percent of our body mass is made up by these bacteria. It represents over 100 trillion microorganisms. And, it, and it, microbial cells outnumber human cells 10 to 1. And of these microbial cells, more than 8... It, it adds more than 8 million genes to our set of 22,000. So it's got to be doing something. Now, we're only really at the beginning of understanding about the human microbiota. But we know that the evidence is accumulating that demonstrates the importance of the gut microbiota in health and diseases such as allergy and mental health. So what we do in the beginning is impacting our long-term health outcomes. Recent studies emphasise the importance of the window of opportunity in early life during which interventions altering the gut microbiota induce long-term effects or what we don't do in the beginning. Breastfeeding shapes the gut microbiota early in life, both directly by exposure of the neonate to the milk microbiota and indirectly via maternal milk factors that affect bacterial growth and metabolism such as human milk oligosaccharides, secretory IgA and antimicrobial factors. Now, oligosaccharides, these are the good guys, okay? These are, oligosaccharides have many, many purposes and like most things when it comes to human milk, we're only just starting to understand about oligosaccharides and all the other things that, we're, um, that I'm going to be talking about. We really are in the infancy of understanding what is in human milk. Now, Katie Hindi, that, um, that uh, professor that I mentioned earlier, she says that we know more about tomatoes than we do about human milk. And we know a hell of a lot more about erectile dysfunction <laughs> than we do about human milk. 
So we've got a long way to come. But what we do know that there's these really cool guys in human milk called oligosaccharides. There's 100 trillion micro microorganisms living on our body, but we want to make sure that these are the good guys. Now, when a baby is born, it comes through the um, vaginal canal. It comes onto mum's skin, skin-to-skin -skin contact. It hopefully has a feed. This is where we're colonising our babies with, with these good guys. Now, oligosaccharides are the good bacteria in breast milk. They've got a few other roles as well. But mother's milk or human milk directly contribute to a healthy gut full of these microbes. Oligosaccharides are the third most abundant human milk component behind lactose and fat. So they're jam-packed in our milk. And there are currently over 400 to 1,000. You might hear it called human milk oligosaccharides or HMOs as well. There's over 400 to 1,000 found in breast milk. And what's really, really interesting about HMOs is that every mother's HMO profile is different. So what HMOs I make for my baby will be different to the HMOs that you make for your baby. Again, specific. Now, what they are is, we've all heard about probiotics and the benefits that they have on our gut. So if this is the gut wall here, this is your intestine, and these are the probiotics, they kind of look like Pac-Man there. These are the oligosaccharides. They're the food for the um, probiotics. Without the oligosaccharides, the, um, the good bacteria, they can't grow and flourish, okay? Oligosaccharides are the food that help um, the good bacteria to proliferate and grow. Now, they're sugars, but they're the sugars that we want to eat. The next few slides you'll see um, are heavily laced with delicious donuts and cakes. And that's because they're, you know, everybody likes sugar, but so does bacteria. We'll talk about that in a moment. But oligosaccharides, they have an anti-adhesive component to, to um, microbes. They prevent pathogen attachment to the mucosal surfaces. They lower the risk for viral, bacterial, and protozoan parasite infections. They also help our brain growth and development. So really, really important. They are highly concentrated in colostrum. Highly concentrated. Preterm mother's milk has 10 times higher concentrations of human milk oligosaccharides. Okay? So again, that preterm body knows that, it, that these babies are vulnerable and it needs it more. Okay, so I think this is a Donna Hay um, cake and it does look absolutely delicious. But guess what? So do the bacteria. They, they thrive in sugar. When we look at an image like this, the bacteria are thinking, oh, here we go, we're going to have a feast here. Now, what the oligosaccharides do is they prevent the bacteria from being able to adhere to the mucosal surfaces. Now, here we've got a diagram of... So this is the mucosal surface, or the intestinal, intestinal mucosal cells. Now, on the gut wall, embedded into the gut wall, we've got these receptors. And for the purpose of this demonstration, we've chosen norovirus. So the baby's ingested or been exposed to norovirus, and in the, in the gut wall, we've got the norovirus receptor. And on the end of these receptors are those sugars, okay, in these little circles here. What happens is... The norovirus thinks, oh my God, there's my Donna Hay cake. I'm going to go and eat that. And then it enters the gut wall and the baby gets norovirus. But with oligosaccharides, they mimic, they replicate themselves to mimic the virus receptor and they encapsulate the virus and they excrete it in the baby's feces. So they're protecting the baby from getting that virus. I'll just show you this animation. Okay, so that's the virus being attracted to the cell wall, uh, to the receptor site. 
and then the virus being encapsulated and then excreted in the faeces. And we know this by looking in babies' nappies and seeing the virus encapsulated by oligosaccharides in their nappies. So we've protected that baby from that illness. Now, if their mother's exposed to that illness, again, she'll be making specific antibodies to this particular illness. Proteins. Human milk contains over a 1,000 proteins, and proteins can help to kill bacteria, identify pathogens, and some are guards that protect, protect against microbes. Alpha-lactalbumin. Now, we're going to be talking about a really, really cool component of um, alpha-lactalbumin called the Hamlet cell. Alpha-lactalbumin protects against infection, aids in processing nutrients, and then we've got this amazing cell called the Hamlet cell. Lactoferrin prevents against inflammation, promotes tissue growth, and it also provides some immunological benefits as well. Lysosomes, antibacterial effect, killing and inhibiting the growth of bacteria. You can see there's a theme going here. It's not really about nutrition, although there is a nutritional component, obviously, to human milk. But we're getting to the point that this is medicine. Human milk is actually medicine for our babies. And casein is the main nutrition um, providing factor for our babies. But this is the only time in the presentation that I talk about nutrition because the focus really is on how amazing human milk is as, as a medicine. OK, let's talk a little bit about um, Hamlet. Now, human alpha-lactalbumin made lethal to tumour cells. And what it is, it's a cell that they, they pretty much stumbled across by accident. So Katharina Swanberg in Sweden and her team were looking at ways to harvest new medicines or new antibiotics by using breast milk. And they were putting tumour cells into a test tube. And what they found was that the, that the, um, the tumour cells were dying, but the cells, the healthy cells that they had in there weren't being affected. So they wanted to um, have a look and see what was going on. And what they found was this Hamlet cell. Now, the Hamlet cell has to go a, pr a process for it to be able to, um, to do its magic. When it connects with an acid or when it is frozen, the molecule is unwrapped and exposes the Hamlet cell. Now, the, the absolutely amazing thing about Hamlet cell is that it induces apoptosis, again, cellular death, in the tumour cells, but it leaves full, the, the healthy cells unaffected. It spares the healthy, mature cells. So the tumour cells die in a non-toxic way, and many tumours are now showing the same response. So... Do we have a medicine here for people with cancer that isn't going to cause them the problems that chemo or our traditional um, therapies, chemotherapy and radiotherapy, um, you know, give to, to people? And the answer is absolutely yes. So they wanted to study this more and they've gone on to do more studies. And what they've found is that Hamlet cells... They help patients with bladder cancer. When we apply, when we give um, people with bladder cancer the Hamlet cells, within seven hours they're excreting the dead tumour cells in their urine. When we apply topical Hamlet, so onto our skin, it onto skin warts, it's removing and reducing the skin warts, so the papillomavirus. When we look at our most difficult to treat cancers. So our glioblastomas, our brain tumours, we are having a reduction in these tumours. These people are surviving longer, but they're also surviving better because they're not being exposed to these horrible, horrible treatments. It reduces colon cancer progression by 60% and it delays cancer progression. Now, when I read this, I thought, my God, why... Why aren't we going full steam ahead with this therapy? You know, this, this seems like it's groundbreaking. And indeed, um, Katharina Swanberg and her team thought that as well. But when I heard her speak at a conference recently, 
She said that when they released this information, um, when they published their information, they expected it to be a bombardment of people um, banging down their door to try and come and um, help um, grow this therapy. But she said it was like crickets in the night. No, no people, um, no pharmaceutical companies coming and, and, you know, wanting to look at this therapy. Now, I'll leave you with your own thoughts on that on why. Um, but potentially it's because human milk is in abundance. It's, I'm not going to say it's free because there is a, um, a, an economic value there. But perhaps that is why. Anyway. So this is some pictures of the um, colon cancer that has been directly treated with Hamlet. So this is before. You can see all the nodules there, the, the tumours, and this is after. And remember that no harm came to this patient. They didn't have the nasty side effects from chemotherapy or radiotherapy. Didn't kill any of the healthy tumour cells, just, uh, sorry, the healthy mature cells, just the tumour cells. So, the findings suggesting that Hamlet might be formed in the stomach of the infant and benefit the breastfed child. So when the, um, the breast milk is connecting with the acid in the stomach, and it needs to be a pH of 4 for this to occur, the baby may be getting the benefit of these Hamlet cells. Now, again, we don't know a whole lot about this. We're going to be learning more and more about this in the future. But is this why children who are breastfed are less likely to get childhood cancers? Perhaps. We don't know. But it's happening within the baby. It's amazing. All this because of human milk. Okay, let's talk a little bit about lactoferrin. Now, lactoferrin is another really, really cool component of human milk. Again, it has many um, purposes and many functions. It's one of the major iron-binding glucoproteins in colostrum, and it's immunomodulatory, so it's helping the immune system. It assists, in, it assists in iron absorption by helping the uptake of iron in the cell through specific receptors in the infant intestinal tract. Now, breast milk is relatively low in iron, but the bioavailability of iron, when it connects with the lactoferrin, it's absorbed more readily. Okay, So lactoferrin assists in the iron absorption or the bioavailability of um, iron in the breast milk. It absorbs iron molecules, preventing pathogens from obtaining iron survival. And lactoferrin acts, as a constrain, acts to constrain bacterial growth by binding iron limiting iron needed for growth of bacteria and other, other pathogens. So what it does is if we've got excess iron floating around in our system, now pathogens need iron also to produce and reproduce and to survive. Lactoferrin mops up the extra iron. It takes away the extra iron that is available for these pathogens, so it stops disease processes from happening. Pathogens involved in infantile illnesses require iron, again, for growth and replication, and excess free-floating iron is a feast for pathogens. When we remove that from the system under the influence of lactoferrin, then that is eliminated. And again, it's higher in preterm milk. Again, the body knows it needs to produce more lactoferrin. Now, the interesting thing about lactoferrin is that when we have, when a baby is born, it gets most of its iron stores passed from the mother. And over the next six months, the iron naturally decreases, okay? And because we've got not a lot of iron in our breast milk, until that baby is starting to have complementary foods, the iron, it doesn't really have an abundance of iron being made available to it. And perhaps this is an evolutionary process that's going on because remembering that excess iron helps bacteria to grow. And what's happening at around six months with babies? What are they doing? What are, or what are they starting to do? Explore. They're starting to crawl. They're starting to put things in their mouth. So we've got an increase in pathogen exposure. So perhaps this is a natural 
protective mechanism or an evolutionary process that has happened for us to not get sick. But what are we doing with our formula? We're pumping it full of iron. The formula companies are promoting high in iron, better for baby. Perhaps this isn't the right thing to be doing. Maybe this is going to be detrimental to our babies. And maybe this is another reason why bacteria can flourish in formula. Okay, fats in human milk. Another really, really important component of human milk. Fats are essential for infant growth and brain development. A third of our brain grows between week 32 to 40. So what happens to our premature babies? They're missing out on this brain growth development. They have to do that once they're born. The fats help their brain to be able to continue to grow and develop once they've been born. Omega-3, a critical structural component of the brain, essential for cognitive development, vision and nerve supply. It's ingested by the infant during critical periods of neurodevelopment and formula-fed babies only maintain the amount they had at birth. So we can't put this in formula. The omega-3, or the fatty acids that we do find in infant formula, they're sourced from micro, fermented microalgae or from soil fungus. So really, really different sources. We cannot replicate the way that the body creates these fats in formula. We can try, and they are trying, and babies do grow. Their brain does continue to grow if they're given formula. I mean, that's, that's evident with um, what we see. But we know that um, breastfed babies have a one to three increase IQ than um, formula-fed babies. And it's because of the fats. Now, another really important fat that is created or a process that the fats do is the myelination of the, of the um, axon cell. So here we've got the axon and the nerve cell, the sheath, the, my, the, um, the process that's responsible for one cell talking to another cell in the brain. Now, these fats, you can see this circular image around here. Now, this is directly from fat that these sheets are made. Now, if we don't have this, then we go into this situation, an un unmyelinated axon. And who can think of a disease process where the myelination breaks down? MS, yeah. 25% more likely to um, get MS if you're not breastfed. Now, this was a really interesting study that they've only just released. And what we've got here, we've got the two images here and here. And it's really evident to see. What they did was they took 47 preterm infants and they were um, ranged between um, they were 29 to 33 weeks. And babies who exclusively received breast milk for at least three quarters of the days they spent in hospital showed improved brain connectivity compared with the others. They MRI imaged these babies' brains, and the differences that they found were that the effects were greatest in the babies who were fed breast milk for a greater proportion of their time spent in intensive care. So these babies here... Oh, sorry. These babies here received 75% of their milk intake as human milk. These babies here received 95% of their um, milk intake as human milk. And you can see the connectivity in the brain is far greater in the babies that received more. Now, this indicates that it's dose-dependent as well. So the more you get, the more benefits you have. And it's evident in the brain, but it's also evident in some other um, areas which we're going to talk about um, as well. So really interesting. I love this graph just to show, you know, really, really simple, easy way of showing or seeing that human milk is having an effect on the human brain. Um, these studies are all, actually I meant to say earlier, all the references, we've, we've got hundreds and hundreds of references. If you want any of the references, just let us know and we're more than happy to share those with you. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about neck. Now, 90% of infants who develop neck are premature. And prevalence has not decreased despite modern technology and advances. So all the, all the advances that we've had um, in healthcare, all the advancements that we've been made, being able to survive these 23 weekers, that, you know, wasn't happening when I first started in the NICU, we haven't had any effect or impact on our rates of neck. We are not winning the battle against neck. 12% of infants born less than 1,500 grams will develop neck, and of those, 30% will not survive. Big numbers we're talking here. And those that do survive go on to have long-term sequelae, comorbidities, short bowel syndrome, developmental delays. So we don't want our babies to be getting neck. Now, the only consistent independent predictors for neck remain prematurity and formula feeding. Premature combined with formula can equal neck. You've got a three times increased chance of neck if you're formula and breastfed. You've got a six to ten times increased chance of neck if you're exclusively formula fed. And you've got a 20 times increased chance of neck if you're exclusively formula fed and you're less than 30 weeks. Now, that's a lot of our babies. Okay? 40% of the infants need surgery, and this is approximately 19% of NICU expenditures. So all the costs of the NICU, the day-to-day runnings of the NICU, 19% of them equate from neck. Now, it's never nice to talk about dollars when we're talking about babies, but often the economists in our system, this is the language that they speak, and this is the, this is the type of evidence when we're trying to make a practice change that we need to be showing our decision makers. Medical neck costs, this is per instance, so per episode, costs 110000 Australian dollars and it extends the stay for up to 22 days. Surgical neck, so babies that need surgery, almost $300,000 per instance, and it extends the stay for up to 60 days. 30% more likely to be readmitted if you're formula fed, and and that drops down to um, 13% if you're human milk fed. And again, it's dose dependent. The more milk, you, the more human milk you get, significantly lowers the hospitalisation costs. It's dose dependent throughout our, throughout our critical periods. We want to um, avoid the use of um, formula if we can. We want to use colostrum. We want to avoid the use of formula within the first 14 to 28 days of life or over the whole NICU stay, and then post-discharge. The higher the dose of human milk over the critical periods, the greater the provision of risk reduction. We can see here with this study that for every human milk dose increase of 10 mils per kilogram per day during the first 28 days post-birth, the odds of sepsis are reduced by 19%. 10 mils per kilogram per day is nothing, right? Imagine what would happen if we look... So this study only looked at um, increases of 10 mils per kilogram per day. Imagine what we would find out if we looked at 20, 30, 40, right up to a full quota. Now, imagine the the odds of sepsis, of a reduction in sepsis that that would show us. So infants who receive human milk feedings had fewer days of TPN, fewer episodes of enteral feed intolerance, lower incidence of neck, CLD and ROP. And again, it was this dose-response relationship between the amount of human milk and the number of episodes of late-onset sepsis. Now, in this particular study, these infants gain weight more slowly. And this is a really interesting point because we try and fatten up our babies really quickly so that they can we reach these weight targets to go home. But now what we're learning with our research around obesity and long-term health outcomes, is being fat early the answer? 
And certainly in this study, the babies gained weight more slowly, but they were also discharged two weeks earlier. Be interesting to see what happens over the obesity studies that were, that are going on throughout the world to see where we go from here. Maybe we're not doing the right thing by fattening them up really quickly. How fat is too fat? Okay, human milk. It's alive. It's dynamic. It's changing from day to day. It's changing from feed to feed. The mum, there's a, there's a beautiful relationship between the mother and the baby. What the baby needs, the, the mother will make. When the, when the baby latches onto the breast, there's a micro backwash of saliva. And again, that intramammary pathway happening, that mother making specific milk tailored for her baby. Some of the live cells that are absolutely fascinating, and this is a recent discovery, by, again by the University of Western Australia, is that stem cells make up to 30% of the component of human milk. Now, stem cells are really, really important. Adult stem cells are really limited in what they can do. They're multipotent, and what that really means is that they can only do one job. Now, the stem cells that they've discovered in human milk can actually, they're called pluripotent, and they can actually become any cell within the body. They survive in the infant's gut. They're transferred into blood circulation and to different tissues, such as the liver, pancreas, spleen, kidney, and brain. And they integrate into the infant's tissues, becoming functional cells. They survive up to 24 hours at, at room temperature. 20 to 30% of stem cells die in the fridge after four hours. And they're also heat sensitive. So how we treat our milk is really important, how our storage and our thawing guidelines. Fresh milk is important. When we're thinking about using human milk in the NICU, we want to use colostrum first. Now, we want to number our colostrum as well. Is that a um, practice that everybody does in their places of work? Yeah. yeah, yeah. No? I'm seeing some nods there. So basically numbering, uh, um, everywhere is slightly different in the amount of um, colostrum that they'll number, but it's usually 1 to 30, and it's just putting a little label on the colostrum so that you can actually use it in the order that it was um, expressed. This is going to give the baby the immunological benefits because as, as the milk um, changes from the colostrum phase to, um, and as, as it transitions, the benefits do decrease. So we want to give the baby the maximum amount of um, benefits as it was made for the baby. Fresh mature milk is better than refrigerated or frozen milk. So if a mother is expressing, if she's, got a, if she's got a freezer full of frozen milk and she comes in with fresh milk, you want to use that fresh milk for the baby first. And it's for all the reasons, the stem cells, the live cells, they're very, very sensitive. Okay? We want to be giving her the, the fresh milk. Even better if she can directly feed her baby, obviously. But if she can express for her baby and give that milk, um, the fresh milk that she's just expressed to her baby. So with breast milk stem cells, what does this mean with regard to the unique power of breast milk for the growth and development of our baby? 30% of milk stem cells, they're vitally important to our, um, to our health, our repair system. If we're not giving our babies these stem cells, what's going on in their body? And they are now looking at future work um, with the usefulness in breast cancer research using human milk as a regenerative medicine. So, again, um, complementing the Hamlet's um, research as well. And there are many, many people who have not waited around for the um, research to, to show what's happening. There's a bit of a, um, a, not black market, but a bit of a, um, you know, people sharing their milk with um, people that, are have, that have got... <coughs> Um, breast cancer and other cancers, and they're doing well. These people are doing well. Um, there is a back, black market for breast milk in America for bodybuilders. 
because it's so full of protein. Okay, so not all human milk is the same. Now, when we're talking about pasteurised donor human milk, it, it, it is becoming the standard of care for our babies, and a lot of um, tertiary hospitals now are introducing um, pasteurised donor human milk. And we've got milk banks. The Red Cross is just about to embark on um, a nationwide milk bank, um, which is amazing. And we know that donor human milk is better than formula for our babies, but we don't want to rely on donor human milk as the primary source of nutrition for our babies because we want that to be mum's own milk. We want to give, we want to um, set mums up to be able to give them the correct support, the correct information in the early days so that they can have a milk supply for their, their own baby. There are significant differences in mother's own milk and donor human milk in the bioactivity, so the aliveness of the milk. It goes through a process. It has to be pasteurised, it has to be screened, it has to be frozen, it has to be unfrozen. Um, we're killing off all, or not all of the components, but a large proportion of the, the active components or the live components of the milk. That might affect our health outcomes. There's also the mammary gland maturity. So remembering that day-to-day feed-to-feed that the milk is changing. Also, as the baby matures, the milk components change as well. So if we're giving a preterm baby the milk from, let's say, a one-year-old, then we're not going to have a matching of what that baby requires. Still going to be better for that baby than formula, but not as good as mum's own milk. There's also a cost involved, high cost involved of... Um, donor human milk, so they're not equal. Own mother's milk reduces the cost associated with neck and multiple morbidities, and additionally, own mother's milk is cheaper than formula and 12 times cheaper than donor human milk. Again, talking that language. Own mother's milk compared to formula reduces the risk of multiple morbidities and rehospitalization, reducing neck, sepsis, BPD, ROP, neuro neurodevelopmental problems. And donor human milk has been shown to only reduce neck when it replaces early formula. So we need to make the feeding of mother's own milk a NICU priority. We need to have a sense of urgency around getting mother's milk supply up and running. And this is what that lactation consultant knew that I didn't know when she asked me about the milk for the 23-weeker. That mother's milk was specific to her infant. The benefits of human milk are dose-dependent and mothers should be supported to provide milk for as long as possible for their baby. I'm going to say it again because it's vitally important. We need to create a sense of urgency around human milk. What we do know is that human milk from the infant's mother cannot be replaced by artificial sources making the feeding of human milk a NICU priority. And it's our role to advocate for the benefits of human milk. It's our role to inform parents of the things that we've talked about. It's our role to give them the information so that they can make informed decisions for their baby. So that's the end of the presentation. Has anybody got any questions for me? Yeah. Should we be focusing our attention more on that also? Absolutely. Look, if we can, then that would be ideal. There's, a, there's um, research to, that suggests that our circadian rhythms are now determined by the hormones that are released in milk. Um, it would be absolutely amazing if we could get a NICU mum or gi give the baby the milk that was expressed in the morning, um, given in the morning. Um, I mean, that would be best practice if we could do that. Yeah. Yep. Um, obviously you have the case for breastfeeding, but what can you breastfeed? So the mental health of our mum when they can't breastfeed. 
Absolutely. And we can, you, can you repeat the question so everyone okay. can hear? So the question was, um, we, we all know that we need to advocate for human built, but what happens when we've got a mum who can't? What happens to her mental health? Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we know that we know that mothers that are in the NICU are four times more likely to have postnatal depression than um, mums that aren't in the NICU. We know that of those mothers, one in three of them are experiencing one to three symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. We know that um, marriages after 12 months are falling apart after we've had a NICU baby. So these people are vulnerable. So the messaging and how we message to these parents is really, really important. We don't want to be seen as being judgmental. We don't want to be seen as being one-sided. What we do want to do is we want to give the parents the information in an evidence-based manner and then they can make their informed consent. So we often talk about informed consent where, let's use that 23-weeker as an example, those parents before they had that baby would have met with a, a team of people who would have laid all the cards on the table about long-term outcomes, about what was going to happen to their baby. They don't skirt around the issue. But then those parents, they take that, inf that evidence base information and then they make their decision. So in, with breast milk, it's the same thing. We don't want to coerce parents. We want to be acting as a support to them in their decision. But we need to provide them the information so that they can make an informed choice. Now, as healthcare practitioners, We've got a beautiful way with women. We know, we, we do it every, every moment of our day with the, in the way that we, we speak with our um, families, the way that we support them. Breast milk is no different, but we do not want to negatively impact or add to the stress of the situation. There's um, studies that suggest that um, when we don't tell our NICU mums about the importance of human milk, that that has a negative impact on their, um, their NICU experience. If I had only known, then I could have chosen. Um, Adele will talk a little bit more about that in the next presentation also, but it's a really interesting topic. It's a really fine balance, and as healthcare practitioners, we, we, we play a vital role We've got to be careful in the way that we do approach these um, subjects. Oh, sorry. Hi. Okay. Ooh. Um, I'm just. I was just thinking about that. <clears throat> you know, when you were saying about the the mental health and um, effects, maybe of women who can't provide breast milk for their baby. Something little like, you know, if there was a breast um, milk bank available, why can't we get them involved in the process of obtaining that milk for their baby? They, not to get them to do the whole thing, but somehow get them involved in doing that if they want to use, you know, donor milk. Yeah, so they absolutely. feel involved and they're responsible for getting that milk for their baby from a different source, and maybe that might help them feel a bit more... Feel empowered. I mean, that, yeah, that, is, empowered, yeah. that is a great way to, to make um, a mum feel empowered. Um, I mean, there's many, many ways to make a, a family feel empowered, but, yeah, that's a perfect example, getting them involved. I mean, obviously, the, host, the hospital, you want to have your own policy so that you're telling them about this human milk, but if you can get them involved in even warming it up or, you know, holding the the syringe for the baby while they're being tube fed, then anything that we can do to promote that um, bonding, the oral therapy, you know, that can be done with donor human milk as well. Anything that we can do. Thank you. Um, but you born 
people or live in Darwin. So yes. do you have a client with the indigenous population? Um, so I in left Hiku? Darwin when I was 21 and I'm now 42. Oh. So I haven't lived there for a long, long time. Okay. So um, whilst I worked there in the NICU... Yeah. Um, my yes, my yeah. question is, our consumer in here, the large proportion of indigenous mm -hmm. ladies from the remote and wide, and the many of them have no knowledge or understanding or comprehension of what we try to... Uh, 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 work in NICU. Mm -hmm. So is there any advice how to actually approach them? Because uh, many mothers come in here for a few hours, just a 24 week of fall, out, fall out. So, and then just, just kind of get the old panic and madness. So NICU people try to approach them, but they have no prior understanding or education. As uh, like the middle educator, do you have any advice for us to how to approach them for the majority of the uh, clientele they have no knowledge of what's going I, to happen. I mean no, you've always got to be culturally sensitive so really understanding your client base is is vitally important but the the information essentially that you're providing will will be the same information but you need to deliver it in a way that is going to have the most culturally um, um, you know sensitive, sensitive yeah. impact for, for that client but that that's for all cultures as yeah. well. So I would say really understanding your clientele, um, understanding the people who you work with would be, um, you know, your first priority in that instance. Um, the other thing is the son, the, the midwife, the um, neonatal nurse is still try, still, still they're a bit resistant to use a pump from day zero. I'm, L, I, I'm an IBCLC myself. Yeah. So trying to push them, but just, yeah, um, I'd like you to just, the, the, I don't know, inform them to just how important to use a pump from yeah, day zero. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So there, there seems to be, and this is not just here, this is, so I have the benefit of going around Australia and meeting many, many different hospitals, and there is this reluctance to use a pump early, the research shows us that we need to be expressing early, okay? So in the absence of a baby, we need to stimulate the breasts within the first one to three hours after birth. Now, whether that's with a breast pump, whether that's hand expression or a combination of both, it needs to happen. So we need to get away from this old thinking that evidence is now surpassed the, 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 using, the using of breast pumps is helping mums with their lactation, okay? Um, using a breast pump in the th in theatre, if mum's been separated from her baby, absolutely. Um, as, the sooner the better that we can get the stimulation happening, and Adele is going to talk more about that in her presentation, the sooner, the better. The first one to three hours of birth, we've got, a, we've got a critical window period of getting these cells switched on. If we miss it, that's going to impact the rest of her lactation journey. Hi, I'm Jenny. I work in the NICU as Hi, well. Um, thank you so much for your very informative talk. I just have a question around, um, because we are rural and remote, a lot of our mums aren't able to travel with their babies mm -hmm. from where they come. So we have a unique situation where we have a baby who actually needs the breast milk, especially the colostrum, as you've um, yeah. said, is the best. But breasts aren't detachable, so we yeah. have to sometimes wait more than a week for mums to be able to be transported to where their baby is. W with the talk about... Um, donor milk, mm -hmm. would donor milk be appropriate to get those babies feeding in these cases if the mums were in agreement? Mm -hmm. Obviously not as good as colostrum, but would that be an appropriate thing above formula? Yep. Absolutely, 100%. I mean, it's always going to be better than formula, especially when we're talking about neck, okay? So it's a case of as good, uh, you know, um, not as good, but it's a case of better than, I suppose, yeah. So... If you've got the opportunity to use um, donor milk, then absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of research now that shows that the sooner the babies eat, so it used to be that you know you'd have a, a baby that was admitted, they wouldn't eat, they wouldn't start enteral feeds for two to three days while they stabilised because we thought that it was not beneficial for them. We needed to rest their gut. Now we know that getting these trophic feeds in there, getting them exposed to the colostrum, is actually beneficial for them. So we've gone from 
not feeding to early feeding and, and copious amounts of early feeding as well. You know, it always, it all, it's always forever changing our practice. But if we can't have um, mother's own milk, then in this instance, it's still going to be better for the gut than formula. Yeah. Just um, thinking time, it's 9.30 now. I just wanted to say that the neonatal unit is in the process of getting human milk from the Red Red Cross oh, Bank. Um, so, yes, it's just a process of approval and making guidelines. And, we're, yes, a few more months yet. Yeah, well, that's really exciting. Um, you know, when I... You know, when I learned about this, it did make me question my own practice. And, I mean, obviously, you know, with formula, there's a need for it and we need to use it when there's a medical reason. But we do need to be really cautious in the way that we're feeding our babies. And in the instance of the mother not being available, perhaps delaying the feed by, you know, two days is that going to benefit the baby until the mum can come? Um, is TPN better? I don't know. Perhaps it's not. Um, but it's look, it's food for thought, and, and it does make you question your practice when you are giving a preterm baby formula for the first feeds as well. It, um, it's, it always is something that I, I do worry about. And like I said, you know, we all need to be responsible for our practice. And in America, they are there are litigation process is happening because we know this this is evidence based so yeah okay well thank you we'll move on to the next um, presentation now Interest of time is a all right. Are we ready? Round two, and then we get morning tea so we can go see all those lovely donuts and actually have some sugar soon. Okay, so the talk that I've been asked to do is maximizing milk supply and this um, importance of an early start. So, as um, was just um, asked in the question time about this zero hour and initiating supply. Um, it's becoming more and more critically important. The more research that's done in this particular field and in this time period, the more evidence there is of how important it is that we get these mums established in their supply as soon as possible. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through some of the basics. Now, I'm not teaching you all to suck eggs. I know that you know a lot of this, but this is really, really important because I know that there's a couple of students. So it's a nice way to um, start the groundwork and, and work from there. We'll go through the critical um, window to establish a supply, how to initiate a good supply, and then how do we maintain that supply. And then we'll also go through the special requirements for those mothers with separated infants or those pre-termers. So I'm going to start from the beginning. So... During um, what we used to call lactogenesis 1 or security differentiation, um, what we see is because of hormones like estrogen and progesterone, when our bodies fall pregnant, these hormones rapidly increase, and that's to maintain that pregnancy. But it's also to start the foundations for, those, uh, for her breastfeeding. So what we see is this massive proliferation of the ductal system. You see the difference? Massive proliferation of the ductal system. And that's because of these amazing hormones. Then what happens is as the pregnancy progresses, um, we'll see these. This is a volumetric scan. I'm sorry it's so blurry. But this is um, preconception. And you can see the volume of the breast increasing over to 37 weeks and then one month's lactation. So this is what we should see and often see. 
Now I'm going to let um, Chrissy talk about this in her talk. So I'm just going to pass through this. Then what happens is after pregnancy, we have our beautiful birth and we have our baby and we move into the different stage or the next stage of lactogenesis. So it used to be called lactogenesis 2 and it's now called security activation. We are turning those cells on. We've had our baby, we need to start increasing our production and making our production. And again, it's very hormone driven. So we have a sudden decrease in what hormones? Progesterone and estrogen. And a sudden increase of those lovely breastfeeding hormones, prolactin and oxytocin. So prolactin is the milk producing cell. So it's often I've um, heard people talk about prolactin as the, the chef. So she helps make the milk. And oxytocin delivers the milk. So she's the waitress. A nice way to remember on your uni exams. So what we now know is that the secretory milk cells are now switched on and start ramping up production during this stage. Now this occurs and these milk cells switch on irregardless of whether that mum is choosing or hoping to breastfeed or not. So like Christy was saying in the previous slides, that colostral stage is incredibly important and it's important to have those discussions with mums that even if you try hand express or you're expressing or your baby goes to breast just to get that colostrum, your milk supply is going to come in irregardless because this is a system override because of your hormones. So what we used to think is we had six weeks to establish the supply. Who's heard that before? We've got about six weeks, yeah. What we now know through lots of research is actually we've really only got 14 days. Because between seven to 14 days, what milk supply that mother is making is really indicative of where she's going to be in six months' time. So if she's a mum that's only making 500 mils, it's more likely that she's going to be making only 500 mils in six months. So that's why we've shortened and shortened that period of time that we used to think we had weeks and weeks and weeks. And often what would happen is mothers would be discharged with a lower supply and then they'd end up in all sorts of trouble and often go to community health. Oh my goodness, this baby is growing and I'm just not producing enough. And so some mums get caught in that awful... Has everyone heard of top-up trap? Yeah. So those mums that are breastfeeding, then expressing, then they're giving the express breast milk, then they're formula top-ups... It's hard yakka. It's really challenging times. But what we know is if we make some changes in that first 7 to 14 days, that helps prevent all of those issues later down the track. So milk synthesis. There's two current um, research that suggests how milk is actually synthesised. So Phil, feedback inhibitor of lactation. Who's heard of Phil? <coughs> Lovely, and those prolactin receptors. So, Phil, feedback of inhibitor of lactation. It's a very small whey protein that's located that's in breast milk. So, as it increases in concentration, because as the breast is filling and filling with milk and filling and filling with fill, it sends back this amazing feedback to the brain and says, "Whoa." slow down. We don't see exploding breasts, so it obviously works really well. And the brain and the hypothalamus then turns off some of these signals to say, oh, we're getting really, really full. Slow down. Now, what happens is those lactocytes that are full of milk, after a period of time, so say babies with our breasts are thinking, oh, we're weaning, they turn off. And it is incredibly difficult to turn those cells back on. And this is why, for a pump-dependent mother, we want them to express regularly and frequently. So frequency is king. How often should we express a mum who's pump-dependent, do you think, in a 24-hour period? What was that, sorry? Both some numbers. Three hourly. So um, what we say is mum should be expressing about eight times a day. Now, we've, we've moved away. Um, some of the research is now saying instead of being really rigorous with the three hourly... Because what would happen is mums will go to bed at, say, midnight, the alarm goes off at three, she gets up, it's an awful... I've been a NICU mum myself, and when that alarm goes off and you turn over to your breast pump, it's awful. So you might put it off. And so suddenly we're not expressing eight times a day. We might only be expressing, say, six times a day. So the current research is saying um, 
eight times a day, but no longer than a five-hour break. And that gives mums enough time to have a good rest. And then she can catch up during the day. So you, this is why it's really mindful to be aware, aware of this process because we don't want lots of fill always in the breast. And it's another reason why, especially for mum's been expressing or she's had one of those early preterm, um, early term babies that are on and off, on and off the breast, that we get mums to have a feel. Do your breasts feel like they've been sufficiently emptied? The other theory is this prolactin, <clears throat> sorry, this prolactin receptor site theory. So when, when, mothers, um, when babies are first born, the milk producing cells, those lactocytes, are a certain shape. Now that is to allow this accommodation of the prolactin, the hormone, to come and fit perfectly and that turns that cell on. It says we've got stimulation at the breast, so therefore we've got suckling, we need to turn these cells on. Now, after 72 hours, what, they are, uh, what the research is finding is these prolactic, these, sorry, um, lactocytes, which are these beautiful shapes to accommodate this um, prolactin, are starting to change shape. Now, it's this attachment of prolactin to the lactocyte that turns those cells on. It is like a light switch. Along comes the prolactin, turns the cell on, we're good to go. We're ready to make this milk. So how do we get prolactin? Oops. Suckling. Lots and lots of non-nutritive suckling in particular. So you've all seen this. Babies are born. They do their breast crawl. Ooh, there's a nipple. And they do lots of non-nutritive sucking. Suck, 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 suck. Ooh, bit of colostrum. Bit of nutritive sucking. And then they go, suck, 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 suck. And it's this that is causing this sucking, that is causing this huge flooding of the system of prolactin. So if you think about in those early days, and you can see this on <clears throat> this particular paper, so this is days postpartum, early in the piece, we're seeing these higher responses of prolactin. And if you think about it from the previous slide, we need to turn those cells on. So it all marries up. And this is where, when you've got a separated infant, um, that early initiation with the breast pump, and in particular that initiate program. So you're lucky here you've got that program. And for those that are on the line, most of those hospitals have got it as well. So what the initiate program is, there's so much research about how important this prolactin is and how important the stimulation is. Can everybody remember the days when you do five, 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 five? Yeah? Thank goodness they're done. Um, but there's lots and lots of evidence in this building of how important stimulation was. And so what Paula Meyer, who's an neonatologist in America, did is because she saw this in her unit every day, of these mothers that weren't having an adequate supply, and they were marrying the two pieces of the puzzle together. Are we getting enough stimulation early? The answer was probably no. So what Paula Meyer did is she looked at a, the infant suck of a healthy term newborn, and you've seen it, and we've just described it. They go on. Lots of non-nutritive sucking. Ooh, colostrum. Nutritive sucking and a break. And so that's what your breast pump will do. So that's the initiate program. So you think of the initiate program as the program that is turning on those cells. It is causing that massive surge of prolactin to help turn on as many lactocytes as possible. And as you heard in Christy's presentation, we need to turn those cells on. We need to make as much of that amazing milk as we possibly can, especially for those vulnerable infants. What they found in this particular paper and this research was if we... Oh, I'm not very good at going back and forward, am I? If we stimulate using the Initiate program in these early days, so this is when, in that colostral phase, compared this to the old program, and this is the new program, we're turning on more of those lactocytes and we're increasing her supply. 
which is why this program is so, so, so important. It's at your fingertips. Please, please use it. So the evidence found is about 200 mils per day. Now, there is a difference here with the volume of colostrum. And again, I've, I know that I've said it to I've been blue in the face to anybody who's been to an in-service. The pump doesn't replace hand expression. It's so important that those mothers get used to handling their breasts. It's a two-part system. So the breast pump is turning those cells on, it's providing that stimulation, it's surging those, that prolactin. The beauty of the hand expression, especially anecdotally from what lots of LCs have said, is if you get mums to do the pump first and then hand express after, this is where you can then increase the volume of colostrum. Colostrum for some mums is thick as honey. Does anyone see? Some of it's really, really thick. And so um, for those mums, it's really important that they hand express afterwards. So to use that particular program as a quick refresher, you turn the on button, and then within 10 seconds, you press your droplet button, and it will say initiate program running. And then you get mum to turn it up until she's comfortable. So given these two pieces of research in particular with how milk is synthesised, what we know is that it's a one-time event to establish lactation. It is either achieved or it's not achieved. And the interference with the, these initial processes will impact on the whole course of her um, lactation, so months down the track. And like I was saying before, with that top-up trap, maintaining those milk volumes can become really difficult to try and boost that later and in the future. So let's see initiate, and that's how we initiate a supply. So security activation. And then what happens is then we move on to the old, old um, terms of lactogenesis 3, or it's now called gout poiesis. So this is a few weeks down the track, and this is when we talk about um, uh, demand feeding, so supply and demand. So the more that we drain, the higher the milk production, the less we drain those breasts, the lower the milk production. It sort of makes sense, especially when you think about fill. So this is when you would use the maintain program. And there's a gentle, so I often get asked with the maintain program, this is the stimulation phase. So it's when it starts with that quick suck, 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 to help with that oxytocin. And then it'll transfer across into that deeper suck, that deeper expression. So to use the maintain program, you press the on button and you leave it for 10 seconds and the pump knows, oh, you need the maintain. And then it will confirm by saying, maintain running. So this is for those mums that are no longer in that colostral phase um, and they've got their mature milk. So what happens if there's a delay onset of lactation? So what are some of the consequences? So we know we've got about 72 hours to really turn those milk cells on and to cause that prolactin to attach. But what we know is that approximately half the mums with um, delayed security activation or that uh, under 72 hours will only partially activate their milk supply. So think of it this way. If a mum's got 50% of her cells that have turned on, about how much is her milk making capacity? About 50%. But where this becomes a bit of a sad story is, oh, I'm not very good at this at all. What is the number one reason that mums stop breastfeeding? Supply. Now, sometimes this is a perceived supply, and then sometimes this is a real supply. And what we know from lots of research, I told you I'm not very good at this, 60% um, are more likely to quit at four weeks because this is when it becomes really difficult. And often they've been back to the community health and they've seen an LC and they've tried everything for a few days and said, I've done my best. I'm exhausted. And sadly, that's often, um, often they'll then start weaning. So there's another paper that really looked at some other um, reasons why mothers were ceasing <laughs> breastfeeding early. And obviously, we've got that population of those low birth weight and preterm infants. 
So raise your hand if you've cared for a first time mother in the last week. The C-section mum. An older mum, over 30 years of age. An overweight or obese mum. Whoa, we've got some double hands, we've got some waving. Um, we, these are known risk factors that can cause that delay. And when delay is, so it's over 72 hours. And that, has, that can end up with um, consequences for that mother's milk supply. It also includes preterm delivery, those negative neighbor, um, labor experiences, smoking, GDM mums, anxiety and stress, which Christy will go through in more details to why. But it's always a two-part story, isn't it, with breastfeeding? You've got mum and then you've got infant. So who's looked after and cared for a, a NICU or a special care nursery infant? Uh, early term, late pre-termer? Separation illness and those with feeding issues and multiple. So everyone's hand, or well, certainly most people have put their hand up. So these are, these are pretty common. And they're merging. We're seeing more and more and more of these women and more and more of these infants. Women that were not able to get pregnant are now able to do so through the amazing technologies with IVF. So we're seeing more, more cases of, and more chance of uh, this delay of security activation. So while we're talking about all the bad things that can possibly go wrong, let's talk about how we can help. So with preterm infant mothers in particular, what we know is if there's a delay in expression, that first early expression as that question came up last time, um, that can have an impact. That sudden and traumatic interruption of pregnancy impacts on full development of the breast tissue, which Chrissy will go through in more detail. Separation from your infant. We know that we need to be in close proximity to have really help with that oxytocin, which helps with that milk ejection. Infant health implications, the stress. And then the emotional and physiological challenges. So one thing that I've noticed from a number of NICU and special care nursery um, units is your kits that you, you probably go with, um, the medella kits can be used upside down. Now, when we're doing those early expressions, we're only getting one or two or three mils. How empowering is that when you don't have to give a mother a bottle? With the term of, well, oh, don't worry, you're not going to fill it. We just want droplets. But you've still given that mum a bottle. Then um, what one hospital have done is they've now they've got the colostrum containers. Now, these are beautiful. I'll show you them out there. These are the most beautiful containers. They are the same price as a bottle. But what they are is they're, they're narrow, and they've got a, um, a dome bottom. So if mums are getting five or even ten mils, she's quarter filling this bottle. And how much more empowering is that than just barely touching the bottom of a bottle? They're so, so important. And the other thing that Logan Hospital that did an evaluation said was one of their P doctors said, oh, she's got plenty. Don't need to top up with formula. <laughs> Amazing mindset change. But how empowering is that for mum? Because ultimately, that is what she's supposed to be producing anyway. So I'll show you and I'll, I'll give the the department here some. And same for those on the, the line, I'm happy to send some up. So we're going to go through some research about those, the early expression. So the amazing Leslie Parker back in 2012 took a very small population of women, did a pilot study. And they looked at less than one hour for their first expression and then a population of one to six hours. The study was so significant that they then repeated it with a larger cohort. Because they had a larger number of women, they then separated it further. Have a guess what they found. <coughs> so the mothers that, this is the original paper back in 2012, what they found is the mother that expressed early, within that first hour, had significant milk volumes, not only in that first expression, but days, and weeks down the track. Now, the mother that expressed, those mothers that expressed early, at one hour, were getting about 4.19 mils. Sounds a dream, doesn't it? 4.19 mils. The poor mama who expressed closer to five to six hours were getting about 0.1 of a mil. 
Now you tell me in special care nursery when babies have gone off and we start seeing that decrease in that blood glucose and it's normally someone goes, oh, we need to get some colostrum. Is that in the first hour or is that a few hours later? Yeah. So then they'll go back to mum and say, oh, we need you to express. And she's hand expressing and she's trying everything. And she sees the glisten of colostrum. And then we're still left with the situation we need to either feed this baby something on what is normally fed. Or no. So early expression is really important. And it makes biological sense. Ooh, see, I told you I'm not very good at this. So with that first expression, with that first paper, what they found is the pre predominantly most women are expressing around that five to six hours. And so with the second paper, they really wanted to try and separate those timings because it made such a significant difference. So in 2017, there was 180 infants, and they looked at three groups. First hour, so under an hour, one to three hours, three to six hours. And the population that did the best, and the mothers that made um, those onset of lactogenesis, so the, the milk coming in, was the earliest in this one to three hour. And look at the, the differences in the percentages between the three to six. So early expression is really important. Why we think this is occurring is this oxytocin. So oxytocin, as you know, is at the highest concentration just after birth. Now, oxytocin con um, causes that contraction of those smooth muscle cells that surround the lactocytes and cause that milk ejection. It makes sense that we're seeing these higher volumes, these four mils, compared to the 0.6 of a mil down the track um, a few hours later. So before I move on, the World Health Organization, has anybody seen that amazing social media post that they put out about the importance of the first hour? So the World Health Organization had the most phenomenal marketing, I don't know, I don't know if you call it a campaign, but it, it, it was in um, Facebook, it was in all these different social media, and they really, really reiterated the importance of the first hour and how many lives globally it would save if we could get mums to breastfeed earlier, to express earlier. It's now in, um, the first hour expression is well documented in um, the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine and in the protocols for supporting those early term infants and those preterm infants. Um, and it's also in UNICEF guidelines as well. Watch this space. There's so much research being done at the moment with first hour, not only for breastfeeding, but for a variety of different illnesses. So let's talk about where the six hours originally came from. Because in days gone by, I've certainly heard of many hospitals that just said, oh, we might start expressing the next day. Oh, she's so tired. Let her just have a good sleep. We'll express 12 hours later. What they found in 2005, the reason why we started to have six-hour policy was because of this particular paper. And what they found is the mums that expressed greater than six hours post-delivery had low milk volumes at day four. They were significantly at higher risk of not achieving um, a full supply. So low milk volumes of less than 140 mils per day at day four were linked with an eight times risk of low milk supply at week six. It's pretty significant evidence. And now we're saying, actually, we don't really have six hours. We really need to be thinking of the first one to three. So mothers expressing less than um, 140 mils at day four, like I was saying, is an indicative, uh, indication of that low milk supply. So what milk volumes do you think we should be seeing at day four? Have a guess. Throw some big numbers at me. And I'm a bit deaf, so you have to speak up. Any volumes? Six, 700? Not quite that much, thank goodness. So it's about 400 mils on day four. Now, what happens often in special care nurseries and NICU is we'll say, oh, look, baby's daily quote is 140. So mum's aim for 140. Now, that baby's not going to be this tiny forever. And as that baby's milk supply, um, uh, quota goes up, this poor mum, as we know, what she's producing at, say, day seven, which is only a few days later, 
is indicative of what's happening at day 14, which is indicative of what's happening at six months. So it's really important for mums to be aware that day four, it's about 400 mils, so she's got something to achieve. It's how we talk about it, and I'll talk about that now. So, <clears throat> the breast, uh, like I was saying before, so the breast milk volume should meet the demand of the term infant, irregardless of what the daily quota is for her preterm infant. Think of this baby is going to get much bigger. So the Japanese retrospective study with 87 mothers that were born, which infants were born at 32, um, about 32. And what they found is the mothers that were expressing less than 154 mils at day four had significantly higher association with formula feeding of 63%. Makes sense. We have to top these babies up somehow. So it's another paper that is really suggestive of this day four. Other risk factors with Caesar births, which Chrissy will cover in more detail. But we do know that these mums, again, are at risk of that um, lower supply at day, day four. It takes their bodies a while for those hormones to start kicking in and changing. So what about milk volume requirements? So mothers of term infants... When she's got an established supply, we would hope to see her approximately 800 mils per day. For those with preterm, we would hope to see greater than 700 mils per day. And milk, low milk supply is classed as under 500 mils per day. So that's the difference between adequate and inadequate supply. And that's through a number of papers, including Jackie Kent's. That's, that's when once milk's, um, what milk supply has been established. So that's sort of four to seven, uh, uh, seven to 14 days. Okay. So another paper. So this is a Swedish study um, of 138 infants. Again, these were those preterm babies. And what they found is babies who receive high proportions of mother's own milk at day three and day seven significantly rate, uh, related to increased and continued breastfeeding at 36 weeks. If a mother can make enough milk uh, volumes in the first weeks, it shows how positively it impacts for her ongoing feeding in the future. We've got to get the foundations right. We've got to um, stimulate and turn on as many of those lactocytes as we can. So do you document mum's um, expression volumes in charts? Yeah? No? You're not alone. Most units don't. So in um, Australian neonate units, um, what, it's, it's almost a question of, well, why aren't we documenting that these mothers have less than 500 mils in a 24-hour period if we know that there's, they're at risk of having low milk supply upon discharge and therefore possible um, having to top up with formula later? Are, we, um, are they adequately expressing or breastfeeding? And what milk daily volumes documented, um, and why aren't we documenting their, their expressing volumes? How often is it mums that will express and they go, oh, I think oh, I've got 20 mils today, this is exciting, I'm seeing it build, when actually they should be producing more like 40 or 50. All that is is a language change of, well done, my goodness, this is amazing, 20 mils, fabulous. So what we can do now is have a discussion on how often you're expressing. Well, actually, I'm doing about six times a day. Well, if you want to and, you've, and you can, it's always how mum's feeling here over what's happening here. <coughs> but if it's something that's going to help empower her and say, actually, you know, if you express two more times a day, that can help increase your milk supply. We're trying to aim for this. And this is how we can do it. And this is how, how you will be supported in achieving those volumes. So this is from Diane Spatz, who I had the pleasure to meet earlier. It was earlier this year, wasn't it, Christy? Yeah. So she's got 10 steps for promoting and protecting breastfeeding for those vulnerable infants. So she's a neonate nurse practitioner um, in CHOP, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And she does lots and lots of research. So she's one of the professors over there. And she's got 10 very simple steps to follow to really increase that breastfeeding and um, the amount of mother's milk that's provided to her infant. So the first four are neonate nurses should assess milk supply of infant mothers daily. Step one, 
just document, find out how much mother's milk um, she's um, producing. Has anybody seen those expressing diaries? There's apps on your phone these days. My has got a little app on their phone. It's quite easy to do. Assess, um, assessment should include asking how often she's pumping in that 24-hour period. How often do we forget? Sometimes I forget to where I put my keys. Never mind how many times have you actually expressed. So having it documented can actually help mums work out how many times she's expressed. The nurse should also assess for any differences in milk production between the breasts and whether both breasts have been completely emptied. So again, that goes back to fill and making sure that we've emptied those breasts. And nurse assessment should determine if the mother is experiencing any engorgement or blood ducts. Because again, when we've got um, any blood ducts, those lactocytes are sat there, stagnant, full of milk. And what are they going to try and do? Turn off. It takes a lot of energy to make milk. We're mammals. We're ultimately trying to conserve our energy. So if we've got the opportunity to turn something off that's not needed, we're going to do it. So in 2005 and 2010, some research showed that only 50% of preterm mothers produce adequate volumes at, at six weeks. And that rate's not changed. Preterm infant breastfeeding at discharge is between 27 and 68 weeks. Now, when you think about that in terms of volume, um, from what Christy was saying of how important this is, you can see why these mums and these infants need lots of support to try and increase um, their breastfeeding rates at discharge. So this is where it becomes contentious of how do we talk to mums about this and how do we set expectations and how do we empower her to express and I think this quote from Paula Meyer sums it up beautifully. So mums need to know expected breast milk volumes so that they have an, uh, an understanding of what they're trying to achieve. So some really important studies have found and shown that informing mothers about the differences between human milk and formula does, does not make mums feel guilty, coerced or pressured. In fact, it does the opposite from what the papers were finding, was it actually empowers them. And it gives them a real sense of what they're trying to achieve and trying to help their babies. I know as a NICU mum, the only role I had was to give my milk to my baby. And it was really hard work. It was really stressful. But I had somebody said to me, my goodness, you know what? Even in this tiny few meals that you're giving, it's doing this and this and this and this. How empowering is that for a mum? Excellent. I am making a contribution. I am making a difference. In another study, um, women expressed anger and frustration with health professionals who failed to share this knowledge with them and failed to tell them what they needed to try to achieve. So, basic care plan for mothers. We need to teach mums how um, to express one to three hours post-birth. Aim to express a minimum of eight times in a 24-hour period with no longer than a five-hour break. Double pumping. Teaching hand expression as well as pump, not as an instead. So think of the pump as causing that stimulation and turning those cells on. Hand expression is great for producing the volumes um, of colostrum, especially if it's thick. <coughs> Educate mums to use an expression diary and document all volumes. Day four is how many mils? 400. Day seven, about 700, and so forth. So how can we do this? It's all we're talking about, or well, we need to do it, but how? So there's a couple of things. Double pumping. So double pumping means doing both sides at the same time together. Now, what the research found from Danielle Prime is that that milk is of higher energy content, which is particularly important for our more vulnerable infants and population the mums were expressing an extra 18% uh, more volume. And we were getting far better breasts, um, uh, far better, uh, oh my goodness, what's it called? Expression um, and breast drainage. It's obviously a time thing. If you are a mum that is pump dependent, and I'm about to tell you that I'm going to cut down your pumping time by half, do you think a compliance to do this is going to go up? Of course. So why double pumping? 
So this was um, from Danielle Prime's um, information. It found that the mums that were... Oh, I can't do this. See, told you. I'm not very good at this. Those mums that were expressing um, doing two at once found these significantly it, um, more volume in a shorter amount of time. So hands-on pumping. So this is something else that you can teach mums. While you're expressing, make sure that you're touching your breasts and make sure that we're getting really good breast drainage. I saw some amazing, amazing, amazing um, crop tops that a mum had brought in, so really old daggy crop tops, cut a little slit, popped in the shield, and then put the crop top over the top, and then started touching her baby's toes, having her baby in skin to skin, and my goodness, this milk was flowing. It was amazing. So hands-on is known, hands-on pumping is, um, also helps with increase in supply, and you can watch the, the video and show mums how to do it by going to the Stanford, Stanford Medicine uh, website and watch that video, it's fabulous. The other thing is making sure mums are correctly sized. Um, have I got the shield? Oh. We are not all, we don't all have the same shoe size and our nipples are not all the same size either. So why we are trying to force a large nipple into a tiny funnel is not helping that mother at all. In fact, what can happen is if we've got a large nipple and we're putting it into, say, a medium kit, it starts rubbing. Now, if you're a pump-dependent mum and in your desperation you have cranked up that breast pump and they do do it behind closed curtains, fine, I'll give you more milk. I'll crank it up. And if she's not sized properly, you've got a recipe of disaster waiting to happen. And same vice versa. You don't want a smaller nipple going into a larger funnel where the areola is being pulled in. Because where that areola starts having friction, you can do damage to the areola. Now, there's a wonderful video on, and I will show you, um, I'll leave some rulers outside. Get mums to watch. It's a two-minute video on what they should see. So there's very few words in it. It's all about what, what you should and shouldn't see when you're expressing. And that in itself can make a huge difference because things like cortisol and adrenaline and all those pain hormones stop oxytocin doing its role. So she'll get better milk volumes. This is that particular video. <coughs> so also make sure that um, by doing this, um, it prevents that damage and that soreness, but it also aids with drainage. So what we know is that we don't just have milk shoot, shooting out here. We don't just have ducts that come out here. We might have ducts on the edge of the nipple. Now, if that edge of the nipple is being pushed against a solid, solid material, that, that funnel, is that going to be able to be expressed? No. Because there's a physical blockage. So that's another reason why we need to make sure that the, the shield's fitted properly. What else can boost mum's milk supply? Skin to skin. My goodness, the love hormone is flowing. Oxytocin flows with this beautiful skin to skin contact, which is something that Chrissy is going to go through. We know, especially for preterm infants, I don't know how many papers we've read over the years that find that cardiorespiratory and those temp temperature stability and mums raising their blood, uh, body temperatures to warm that infant. We know that here we have better neurological development outcomes, that modulation of pain responses, and in particular for this talk, enhanced breastfeeding. So over in Sweden, is it Sweden or Switzerland? Sweden. So in Sweden, isn't it beautiful? I love this picture. So in Sweden, it is a human right for every infant to be in 24-hour contact and skin-to-skin -skin contact with another human being. It's a human right. And we struggle in Australia and throughout the world with even trying to achieve one to three hours. Yet we've got so much research about the importance of skin-to-skin. -skin. And I know Chris is going to go through of how that can really help boost the supply. Be, um, I think it's so beautiful, that picture, isn't it? Expressing close proximity of the infant. So like Christy was saying, you have that immunological benefit 
The mother is surrounded by those pathogens that surround her infant, and she's amazing at making those um, white blood cells and that response to help support that infant. But also by expressing in close proximity of your baby, it helps increase that oxytocin. It helps us feel really lovely towards our baby, and that helps that milk flow. We know that we see these higher milk volumes. So has everybody been in a unit where they've got a completely separate, um, I suppose, expressing room? So in days gone by, so my eldest is 14, I'm sure my age. In days gone by, so when my daughter was um, in NICU, there was an expressing room. And you wheeled your little breast pump over, and you sat down in this cold, awful chair. And do you think that was conducive to helping expressing volumes? So there's lots of things that you can do. Just get mums to express next to that, um, their babies. I'm not going to cover this. as Christy will. And I'm going to let Christy do these ones. Beautiful. Check in on expressing frequency. Don't let Phil become your enemy. Make sure that Phil is always clear from that breast. And that's why I'm saying things like just having that consultation with mums and saying, where are we at with your milk volumes? Or how often are you expressing? Oh, six times a day. Fantastic. Did you know if you express a little bit more, is that something that you want to do? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can do that. I can't do it every day, but hey, I can do that. Power pumping. Now, once we start talking about things like power pumping and cluster pumping, it's critically important if you've got any concerns with low milk supply, the lactation consultants have brought in. They are phenomenal women that have spent hours upon hours upon hours of learning about lactation and supporting mums. And these are some of the strategies that sometimes they will use. Now, a lot of this is anecdotal. There's not a huge amount of evidence out there. Um, but power pumping is one that has been found um, anecdotally to increase supply. So it's frequent pumpings in short periods of time. So over one hour, mums will double pump for 10 minutes and then they'll stop. And then they'll double pump for 10 minutes and they'll stop. And they'll double pump for 10 minutes and then they'll stop. And then their mums will stop doing that and then it's reassessed after three days. This has to be given with really clear instructions. Could you imagine if a mum accidentally does this for a couple of hours? It could end up with quite detrimental impact. So this is why it's really important to um, have an LC and make sure that language and what we're saying is really clear. The other one is cluster pumping. Who's heard of cluster pumping? Yeah. So three to four hour period of time and then mums will pump on the hour for 10 minutes. Again, really clear instructions need to be given, and it's a reassessment after two to three days. Don Peridone. Isn't it amazing on how often so many doctors will go, right, let's go straight to Don Peridone. And often, Don Peridone, uh, which stimulates the release of prolactin, remember what we said about prolactin, it's important for early. Um, some mums have a really great response from domperidone or motilium, and others don't. Um, it's not a magic pill. It's part of a toolbox. And it's all good having all this extra prolactin, but we need to make sure that we're expressing to, to help supply. This is part of a story. It's not the, the magic pill that fixes everything. So there was um, a couple of papers. The first one um, was a double-masked um, RCT where they looked at 90 mothers. Now, the, some of these infants were really quite preterm, so not less than, uh, greater than um, 29 weekers. And what they found was <clears throat> that there was uh, about 50% increase um, in milk volume after day 14 compared to group B. So group A was um, the... Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, the, the Don Peridone group. Group B was a placebo for 14 days and then followed by with Don Peridone for 14. And group A achieved higher milk volumes than group B. So some risks with Don Peridone. So who's at of risks with Don Peridone use in particular? So a number, of, so there was two studies in particular and what they did is they looked at males and use of Domperidone. Are males our population of breastfeeding women? Nope. And also women that were over 60 years of age. Again, not quite our population of women. 
So taken together, these findings provide evidence of a favourable safety profile for domperidone use in breastfeeding mothers. Now I'm going to go through this because Christy will go through this. So in summary, tie up. So it's really important that we re remove milk early and within that one to three hours after birth. Expressing frequently, so that eight times in 24 hours, we're no longer than a, how many hour back? Five hour gap. Double pumping, making sure that she's sized properly, expressing at the bedside, prolonged skin to skin contact. We need to teach mums to use their hand in collaboration with pumping. And we need to check in on volumes. So day four, how many meals? Day seven to 14. And less than 500 is a flag for lactation failure or low milk supply. Thank you. And any questions? Oh. Do you want to see if the um, rural is, people want to have any questions? Does anybody really have any questions, those that are dialing in? For myself or for Christy? Sometimes I don't, sorry, I just, just that, yeah, I'm, I'm midwife too. Um, induction, the drugs can interrupt the oxytocin release. So just the, sometimes you don't get any milk for the mm -hmm. first probably 72 hours, yep. especially the PPH. Yep. And also the really um, small breast people or the really the large breast people. Yeah. So they're just the, the need to know it's mm. oxytocin use it's not actually advisable for <laughs> breastfeeding but I just some hospital has lots and lots of induction because mm. due to the mothers just that the people need to be aware those mothers don't get milk yeah I think the other thing with that too we've seen this emergence of those late preterm infants too and those early term infants and what often happens is they get wrapped like little burritos and they go next to the cot, not necessarily skin to skin. Mums will get them out. They'll have a bit of a breastfeed for a couple of minutes, maybe a bit of a lick and a bit of a suck. And then they go back down. And then midwives will come in and say, oh, did you have a breastfeed? And she says, oh, yeah. Look at my baby. It's still, it's so sleepy. It's beautiful. It's like, when really what's happened is you've got to think of that breast. Has that been, um, has that breast been stimulated enough? Has she had those prolactin surges and those... Um, those extra hormone responses. Any other questions? No? Beautiful. Thank you, everybody. So we've got morning tea now, and we need to be back here... Um, by just before 11, if that's okay. Um, just some um, general housekeeping. Um, I know you, um, hopefully everybody signed in for their certificate for the session today. Um, I also have, um, um, we release a quarterly um, newsletter um, and it's got the latest research in the newsletter. So it's only four times a year. If you're interested in signing up, I've got a sign-in sheet that um, Melinda, next to Melinda, uh, sorry, Nikki over there. Um, so if you want to receive that um, newsletter, just sign in. Okay, so um, we are getting a bit pressed for time, so let's move right along. Um, we've got two presentations before lunch, and we do need to be out of here at 12.30. So depending on how we go with time, we might save questions um, for the next block. Um, we're going to talk about the science of breastfeeding, anatomy, physiology, and sucking. We're going to um, briefly discuss anatomy of the breast. Now, Adele went into um, that in more detail in the previous session, and also the physiology and milk synthesis has been touched on already. So we might just um, skip over those or talk about that very quickly. Um, we're going to examine how babies suck at the breast, take a look at milk removal dynamics and examine again um, how milk initiates, builds and maintains 
And then if we've got time, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, nipple trauma and some steps to help. Um, we can cut that out if, um, if we're pressed for time. Okay, so I'm going to take your, ask you to cast your mind way back to 1840. And Dr. Sir Astley Cooper was interested in the female lactating breast. And what he actually did was got a lactate, lactating gadaver and under pressure injected hot wax into the ductal network system. And then he got his friend, who was an anatomical drawer, to slice the um, gadaver, and then they drew the anatomy of the breast from what they found. Now, this didn't change <coughs> until 2004, okay? So we used Dr. Sir Astley Cooper's information right up until 2004. Now, understandably, we've made some advances in our medical knowledge since then, and there's some vast differences um, that we've found from the original anatomy and physiology. So what, um, what a major component of um, Dr. Astley's work was that when they injected the wax into the nipple, and they used different colours for the, nipple, for the different ducts that they were injecting, but what you can see here is there's these little... Um, pouches or little bits of pooling here and they thought that they were lactiferous sinuses. So we've really based what we know about how the breast lactates and how babies remove milk on this information. However, in 2004, Donna Geddes um, and her team at the Peter Hartman Research um, Group in the University of WA they were actually ultrasounding babies' mouths and looking at the way that babies suck at the breast. And while they were ultrasounding the mouths, they were also ultrasounding the breasts as well. And they couldn't find these lactiferous sinuses. They just couldn't see them. So they went on to do the, um, some studies to find out exactly what was going on in the breast. And they actually found out that they don't exist. And what we hypothesise has happened is that as that hot wax has gone in under pressure, it's cooled and pulled and given a false indication of the sinuses or the lactiferous sinuses that actually aren't there. Okay, some other differences that they found was that the ducts branch closer to the nipples. Branches aren't as deep as what they thought. They sit closer to the nipple end. Again, no lactiferous sinuses. These don't exist. Glandular tissue is also found closer to the nipple. So 65% of glandular tissue is within three centimetres of the nipple. Now, when we examine our own breasts or we examine a mother's breast, you can feel how close it is to the nipple. It's not as far back as what they once um, thought. Also, it doesn't have this radial or symmetrical um, layer that they once um, hypothesised. They used to describe it as like a petal or a flower-like arrangement inside the breast. What we actually know is that it's more like a bunch of grapes. Okay? And, and the analogy of using a bunch of grapes is actually a really good um, way to imagine it in your mind because it's dense tissue and there's no um, patterning of where things are laid out. And perhaps women that um, experience bouts of mastitis have got the, the pathways in there that are under pressure and are a little bit bunched up like the bunches of graves. You might have seen this picture here. So this is from the Body Works um, exhibition that has gone all around the world. And this is their... So these are real cadavers as well, but they have put this outdated information on here. This is not what the representation of the breast looks like. So I've written to them to explain that, <laughs> that, we, that they need to change their, their models. 
There's also fewer ducks exiting the nipple than previously thought. We used to think there was about 15 to 20, and now we know there's anywhere from four to 18 with an average of nine exiting the nipple. So the pathway that the milk actually comes out. Now the human breast is an exquisitely individual organ. There's no other organ in our body that changes the way that the human breast changes. It changes from in, in size and function, it changes from when we um, enter puberty to when we have a baby to then when we um, um, experience menopause. And while lactating, the human breast consumes more energy than the brain. Lots and lots of activity to get the human breast um, activated. Now, we briefly touched about this earlier, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but under the... Um, Influence of oestrogen and progesterone, we've got secretory activation or the development of the breast tissue. We've got the proliferation of growth, getting that breast prepared for breastfeeding. Now, again, the volumetric guide, I'll just um, go over that again with you. So this is preconception, and we've got breast changes all the way through pregnancy right up until we get to 37 weeks here, the second from the bottom. And you can see here the difference in volume that this breast has undergone. Okay? Now, this is one month after this particular mother has had her baby. So what this shows us is that there's still growth that can happen after the mum has had a baby. This is really important as a lactation consultant, that when, when you... Um, uh, consulting with a mother, we do want to know about breast changes and breast growth and breast development. But contrary to what we used to think, that if you experienced no growth or no breast changes during pregnancy, that you weren't going to be able to breastfeed, we now know that this growth can continue to occur after we've had a baby. Yes, we want to know about these women, and yes, they are a red flag, but it may not be a make-or-break situation for her lactation course. So this is the same women on this graph Now that, that study, that volumetric study showed. And you can see here, this lady in blue, she's had a fairly stable growth throughout the three trimesters of her pregnancy. And then this lady, a bit tricky to see, the lady in pink here, rapid growth in the early stages and then some... Um, steady development throughout the rest of her pregnancy. I think this blue lady actually is the lady from the graph before. But look at this purple lady here. She hasn't had much growth or development throughout the three stages of her um, trimesters of her pregnancy. So she's the one that we want to be educating prior to her having her baby. She's the one that we want to know in our antenatal clinics so that if she does experience issues with the onset of her lactation, that we've already pre-prepared her, we've already got processes in place to support her before she's had her baby, before she gets to day three and her milk hasn't come in, and then we're going in as lactating consultants and trying to throw every trick in the book at her. Um, and, you know... Um, there's nothing more um, challenging as a lactation consultant than when you walk into a consult and mum has a situation of hyperplastic breasts or something like that where she may never get to full supply. If we examine breasts, if we talk about it beforehand, if we set these mums up, then that mum would already know perhaps she's not going to make her full supply. But we've got the processes in place. She might want to use an SNS. There's many, many things that we can do in that instance. But she's come in armed, knowing that things may not go as planned. What is interesting about this study, though, is that all these mums actually came to full volume. OK? So that purple mum that we were worried about, one month after pregnancy, look at her breast growth here. She is the mum that had boobs starting at her chin a month after delivery. Rapid growth after birth. So it is possible, okay, that we can um, continue to grow and develop our breasts after we've had our babies. And this is particularly important for our preterm mums because it wasn't that long ago that we thought only 50% of preterm mothers could um, get to full lactation. We now know with the right support that 96% of them actually can, okay? 
but we've got to get the right support in place early. Okay, so the next um, series of pictures are a mum, um, the same mother, um, throughout her pregnancy, just to show you the difference in her breasts. And this is probably a picture that all midwives um, are familiar with, perhaps not the, the NICU nurses. Um, but you can see, you can see the um, migration of her areola there, the dotting that's happening there. You can see this lovely veins, this um, system that's coming in to help these breasts grow and flourish. And then 38 weeks of pregnancy, much more volume, darkening of the areola. And then four days postpartum. Now, there's no denying that this mum's milk has come in, okay? I would even go as far as to say that we're slightly engorged here, a little bit of a shiny appearance and flattening of the nipples, but no doubt that her milk is in. What I do want to touch on, though, and it was mentioned by one of the participants earlier, is that breast size does not determine the number of milk-producing cells or the ability to make milk. So you can't look at a breast and determine on how large or how small your breasts are if you're going to make full volume or a half volume or no volume at all, okay? So just because you've got large boobs doesn't mean that you're going to make full volume, and vice versa, if you've got really teeny tiny breasts, doesn't mean that um, you, you're not going to make enough milk. It actually depends on your glandular tissue, the amount of breast making tissue, of milk making tissue that you've got contained within your breast. So no matter what, the, the la people with large breasts can often have a lot of fat in their breasts and maybe only a small amount of um, glandular tissue. What is important is that we give mums, regardless of the size of their breasts, exactly the same information to help them set themselves up for success. Okay, so the milk is stored in the milk globules or the alveoli, so the end of the bunch, the grapes, the end of the bunch of the grapes here. And what happens is we've got We've got a single layer of cells around here, around the lobule. You might also hear it referred to as the alveolus. And these are lactocytes contained within the breast. These are the milk-making cells. And then the milk is made within the actual alveoli itself. And then we've got this beautiful network here of myoepithelial cells. And myoepithelial cells are just a fancy name for um, muscle cells. And what they do, you can actually see in this picture here, it's a really gorgeous um, picture to highlight the network or the, um, the netting of the myoepithelial cells around the alveoli. What they do, and then of course you've got your blood supply bringing um, nutrients to and from um, the breast tissue. Now, what happens is, the myoepithelial cells are there waiting for oxytocin to connect with them. Okay? When the baby sucks at the breast, we have a release of oxytocin from the mother's brain. It floats through the bloodstream. It connects with the myoepithelial cells and it causes them to contract. So here's the lobule. These are the myoepithelial cells. They get squished down and that milk is ejected from the um, alveoli or the lobule out through the ductal system to the baby. And this is called our letdown reflex. Now, oxytocin is an extremely sensitive hormone. Under the influence of cortisol and adrenaline or our stress hormones, it's actually switched off. And there's a biological reason for this to happen. When we were, um, oxytocin is also the hormone that's responsible for the contraction of your uterus in um, pregnancy or in birth. So when we were birthing our babies, when we were back in cave women days, if a predator came along and threatened to eat us or to kill us, obviously we, there would be a demise of both ourselves and our babies. Our cortisol and our adrenaline would rise and our oxytocin would be switched off and we could flee. So we're actually no different now to what we were millions of years ago. But we've got a completely different lifestyle now our evolution hasn't kept up with how fast and how modern our world has become. 
So what we see now, these stress hormones, especially in a NICU environment, are knocking off oxytocin. So as a midwife and as a, um, a NICU nurse, it's up to us to make these mums feel safe, to make them feel like they can relax, to get them to be able to release their oxytocin. If a milk ejection doesn't occur, the baby's not going to get any milk, okay? Breastfeeding stimulates the milk ejection reflex, and most women will have a milk ejection reflex within the first 60 seconds of um, feeding their baby or stimulating their breasts. The average that they'll have during a feed is two and a half, but it can be anywhere from zero to nine. So the baby that gets zero is not transferring any milk, okay? That baby's not getting any milk. Most women can only feel the first milk ejection reflex, and it, it's often described as like a tingly sensation or a cramping sensation, and that's the myopithelial cells contracting. The volume of milk removed from the breast is directly related to the number of milk ejection reflexes, not the duration of breastfeeding. So when we've got situations where we're feeding babies and we're timing their feeds, they may still not be getting any milk. We need to move away at looking at the clock. We need to move towards looking at the baby. Less than 4% of milk can be stored in the ducts. The milk is made and stored in the lactocytes within the milk-making cells. And remembering prolactin is the hormone that will make the lactocytes make the milk, the chef in the kitchen. And the milk ejections are essential for milk removal with oxytocin, the waitress bringing the milk through the ductal system to the baby. Stress can inhibit that milk ejection reflex, so being comfortable and relaxed helps milk flow. And what are our hospitals like for making someone feel relaxed? You know, pretty awful. We've got strip lighting, we've got smells, we've got noise, we've got visitors, we've got all these interference. Um, in my, I'm not a midwife myself, but my midwife friends tell me about how they have mums that ring up and they're labouring really well on the phone and they're, oh, you know, you need to come in. It sounds like you, you know, you're in good labour. They arrive at the hospital and nothing's happening. And what they do is they pop them in a room and they turn the lights down and maybe play some music and they make them feel safe and then the labour cracks on again. So that's a little bit about the mother side of things. But the babies also play a role in removing milk from the breast as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about the science of sucking. So the conventional thought about how a baby removed milk from the breast was based on lactiferous sinuses. We know that they no longer exist. But what they thought happened was that the baby latched onto the breast and used the tongue to maintain that latch and then... It would milk that, with using peristalsis, static motion of the tongue, it would milk the lactiferous sinuses and milk would be excreted into the baby. But what we now know through Donaghetti's research is that vacuum is actually what um, enables the baby, combined with a milk ejection reflex, to remove milk from the breast. There's no peristatic motion of the tongue. The tongue actually undulates, it drops. It creates a negative pressure or a vacuum to get that milk out. There are also some other incidental findings which may or may not be of interest. The nipple doesn't meet the hard and the soft palate. So we used to think that when a, for a baby to achieve a deep latch, we would need the nipple right down at the junction of the hard and the soft palate. So if you run your tongue from the front of your teeth right up over your hard palate, and where you feel that change to soft tissue, that's where we thought the, the nipple needed to go. We now know that it probably doesn't need to sit as far back as that to have an effective feed. Oh. Okay. So this is an ultrasound of Donaghetti's work, and I'm just going to quickly talk you through. It's a cartoon overlay. So what we've got here is... These three stripes here, they're the ducts. This is the mum's nipple. This is the baby's tongue, lower jaw, hard palate, soft palate. And you'll see what happens is, is that as the baby's tongue drops, 
the milk ducts expand. Milk is under vacuum, is excreted with the milk ejection reflex. You'll see flex here, and then you'll see the baby um, swallow. <coughs> okay, so tongue dropping, milk ducts expanding, milk swallowed. I'll just play that again. Oh, I'll just go back and play it again. Okay, tongue dropping, milk duct expanding, milk excreted and swallowed. And you can see here, that baby's, the nipple isn't sitting at the junction in the heart of this, uh, the soft and the hard palate. If we stick our finger right back down there, what do we do? We gag, yeah. So, I mean, while some babies are really happy with a massive mouthful of breast, some babies are quite gaggy as well. We would gag if we stuck our fingers back that far. So again, infants use both vacuum and the mother's milk ejection reflex to breastfeed successfully. In absence of one of those two things, we're not going to have an effective feed. When it comes to our preterm infants, they have difficulty creating, of creating this um, vacuum they lack the musculature, they lack the physiological stability to be able to latch on to the breast and to maintain that latch at the breast. So we need to get inventive with our ways and our techniques that we do with our, our mums of preterm babies. When we look inside a term baby's mouth, they've got big buckle fat pads in their cheeks. Some of them are really big. You know, I can remember the first time I saw one, I thought, oh my God, what is that in that baby's mouth? I thought there was something wrong with the baby because I wasn't used to seeing term babies, I'm used to seeing neonates, when you see the differences between a healthy term baby, their anatomy that is fully developed and compare that to a preterm baby, there's vast differences. So, skin-to-skin -skin contact. Now, Adele touched briefly on skin-to-skin -skin contact in her last presentation, but all babies to ignite their feeding, premature, term, sick, well, they all need skin-to-skin -skin contact to be able to switch on their innate breastfeeding reflexes to be able to feed well. There's a, um, a hospital overseas, again in Sweden, that Sweden seem to be um, leading with our neonatology, especially with our breastfeeding. They will no longer give any money to skin-to-skin um, -skin research. It's done. We know it works. It's been around for donkey's years. It's been around since the 70s. The, the benefits are proven. We now need to just get on and do it. And like Adele said, um, it's a human right there. Now, a group of neonatologists, doctors and um, nurses and midwives went to the High Court and they ruled that every baby would have access to 24 hours skin-to-skin -skin contact. And then over the next 15 years, they changed all their neonatal units to provide a bed to have the facilities to be able to support parents to stay. Now, if the parent can't stay, somebody else stays, the neighbour, the auntie, whoever it is. And you saw the pictures of the siblings, even siblings, they've got an area in their um, nickers that the siblings are welcome and <coughs> they've got little TVs. It's nothing flash. You know, when I first um, imagined it, I thought, wow, these must be really sophisticated nickers. That sounds amazing. No different to our nickers. They've just tweaked a few of the arrangements and given the ability for this to happen. <coughs> so you might have heard of this approach, the mammalian baby-led approach or, the, or laid back feeding. <coughs> I guarantee you, if you have a baby that is finding breastfeeding difficult, if you let a baby do the breast crawl, if the baby has the ability to do it, if you let the baby find its way to the breast, use its GPS system, use its hands, use its innate reflexes, that baby will latch deeply onto that um, breast and it will feed well. Um, there's a really great um, video on um, Nancy Moorbracker. Um, she has got a mum in the laid back feeding position and you can see the baby, um, it's a newborn baby, you can see the baby self latching, getting a deep latch. Um, you don't need anything fancy for this. Mum just needs to be able to recline and let the baby do its, do its business. 
And we look at how other babies feed. When we look at other mammals, we're no different. We are mammals. So what do all these mums here have in common? (coughs) What are they doing? (coughs) They're upright, aren't they? They're looking up or they're laying down. Now, when we think of how we take a drink of water, what we do is we bring the cup to our mouth we, we put our body in midline, we tilt our head forward, and then we drink. Now, we can drink if we're in a different position, but it makes it much harder to do that. But what positions are we teaching our mums to feed in? Baby laying down on their back, maybe cross cradle, maybe football hold. Babies are upside down, they're potentially turning their heads. Are we making it more difficult for these babies to feed? Perhaps. I just wanted to show you this oh, this picture as well. I couldn't help but chuck this in. Look at that mum. Look at her face. <laughs> She's got 19, 19 puppies, I counted. Poor, poor thing. I see desperation in her eyes there. So breastfeeding may not always look as traditional as what we once thought. Babies actually can feed in any position as long as we adhere to the principles of deep attachment. As long as mum is happy, as long as baby is happy and latched well, and milk is being transferred. Now these positions, this laid back feeding and this koala hold are perfect positions for our neonatal babies. They do well in these positions. If we have, if you imagine that this big, robust, healthy, probably six-month-old baby looking there, if you imagine that that's a tiny, tiny neonate and we've got that baby in skin-to-skin contact, that baby, it will take that baby much longer to be able to successfully feed. But every attempt that that baby makes, it's in the place that it needs to be to be able to eventually succeed. Now, a preterm baby may go go into skin-to-skin position. It may move its little hand and wake up and think, oh, I'm I'm, I'm on my mum. I'm feeling like I'm going to get ready to feed. And then that may be all it can do. But that's an attempt at breastfeeding, and this is what we need to be educating our NICU mums, that that's a successful attempt at breastfeeding. Your baby is having physiotherapy to be able to eventually feed, It's not going to look like a term um, breastfeeding journey. Then that baby might sleep for three hours. And then it might be able to bob its way down and it might have a lick at the breast. That's another successful attempt at breastfeeding. But we've got to have the babies here so that they can be able to have the opportunity. Now, I try not to use the word learn because breastfeeding is an innate reflex. We don't need to teach babies to feed. We don't need to teach babies to breathe. We don't need to teach babies to sleep. It's innate in our ability, but we've got to give them the opportunity to be able to practice these skills and to develop and progress. Okay, so nipple pain. Now, is nipple pain normal or not? Well, what is pain? Pain is different for everybody. And... What is pain doing to us? What, what, why do we get pain? To tell us something's wrong. Yeah, to tell us something's wrong. Okay, so if we're having nipple pain, there's probably something that's wrong. However, the studies show that 34 to 96% of mums do actually report nipple pain within the first weeks. That nipple pain does peak between days three to seven. So it does get a little bit, for some mums, it can get a little bit worse before it gets better. But it shouldn't progress longer than the first week. And nipple pain that does continue after seven days is associated with maternal depression and mood disorders. So we need to be addressing nipple pain. Now, I would um, suggest that if you've got a mum that has toe-curling pain, she needs to be assessed. 
if the baby latches on and it's a bit, oh, for the first few sucks and then the pain um, subsides, then perhaps that mum, she may need um, some um, support with her positioning or her latching, but she's probably going to be okay. But the mum that isn't tolerating feeding that baby is more likely to stop breastfeeding. Transient tenderness, especially with first-time mums, peaks on days three to five, usually resolved by day seven to ten, and it's probably because of this increased vascularity and epithelial debridement associated with normal attachment. We haven't breastfed before. These are new breasts. There is debridement of the nipple that is occurring, and in some women this is painful. We know that there's no association with hair colour, so people with red hair aren't more likely to have more nipple pain. And anything that we do prenatally, um, again, my midwife friends tell me that we used to advise mums to scrub their nipples, go out in the sun and, and harden them up, toughen them up. We know that this doesn't work, okay? In fact, it sounds awfully painful. So tenderness that persists persists beyond a week and throughout a feed, it does require intervention, okay? So if you've got a mum that is experiencing pain, you, we want to do something about it. Now, this is some interesting research from um, a doctor called Dr. Robin Thompson. Again, she's on um, Facebook and her, um, her work is really um, food for thought, I think. It, it's really made me... Um, examine my own um, practice. Now, what her research suggests is that these cross-cradle holds, the flipper and the hamburger hold, they actually result in asymmetry and nipple malalignment and they cause four times greater nipple trauma than if we do the mammalian lead and the koala hold positioning. Now, does everybody know what the flipper and the hamburger is? So the flipple is where you get your nipple and you lift your nipple up like that. You let, as the baby takes a wide mouth and latches on, you let it go. And the theory is, is that the nipple will flick back as far back into the mouth as possible. The hamburger technique is that we've got the baby in position. We're squeezing down our breast to be able to mould or shape that breast. And then we're helping that baby latch on. What her research shows is that when a baby latches onto the breast, it needs to have symmetry at the breast. So it needs to have the, the, the contact points of its face symmetrically aligned on the breast. And that when the baby is searching and using its hands, using its own reflexes, it's actually doing that. In that mammalian-led um, approach, it's able to latch on and do that. Um, Dr. Thompson's um, research also suggests that grasping the baby, hopefully never by the head, hopefully we've moved past those days, but by the neck and the shoulders, it actually is restricting the way the baby can move at the breast. Now, I know these were the techniques that I was taught um, for years and years. You know, um, you've got a premature baby, let's give it some um, torso stability, let's hold it behind the shoulders and the neck, and then let's pop it onto the breast. Perhaps we're not doing the right thing. The restriction of um, these techniques limits the activation of the neurosensory abilities to locate the nipple and the breast. And if we're, we're, if we're restricting these, this GPS system, we're knocking off these innate ability to get to the breast. Okay, how are we going for time? Yep, no, that's cool. I will, I will quickly talk about um, some damaged nipples. So here we've got severely damaged nipples. Now, when nipples are damaged, they are so incredibly sore. All that activity and all the um, extra, the warmth and the, um, the growing and, um, you know, the proliferation of breasts makes our nipples extremely sensitive. They're sensitive for a reason because we need to release oxytocin so we can feed our babies. But if you've got a nipple that looks like this, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to your breastfeeding journey? It is going to be cut short. Damage leads to reluctance to breastfeed. Understandably, continuation of poor attachment. 
Now, resting and expressing. Is this an option for mums? Is this something that we should be advising mums? It's probably a tool that we can use, but we need to, um, we, we need to ask the mum what she wants to do. There's other things that we can use. Perhaps a contact nipple shield in this instance will keep that baby at the breast and enable her to continue to feed at the breast, um, but perhaps she can't emotionally um, or psychologically cope with that. So it, you know, when we're assessing a mum and when we're dealing with a mum, that does come into consideration. But we know if we were in this situation, often we're going to have mixed feeding, which enters into that top-up trap, especially if we're early in our lactation journey, and then we're going to have early cessation of feeds. Can I just ask, sorry, yeah. Is that, one where I get, could that, that one? Like white? Yeah, yep. Is that just the language of some type? It, I mean, it does look like a, um, like a vasospasm there. So vasospasm, you see the colour changes from white to pink, sometimes to dark. Um, absolutely, there are other indications that um, you know that can that can make nipples painful. Um, vasospasm and Raynaud's is a big one. Also, this type of um, this type of appearance when it comes out of a baby's mouth can be poor latch as well. So we've got compression of the nipple, so the blood flow is not going there, and then when the baby comes off, it's white and it's painful. So this mum, I mean, clearly there's something there's something going wrong for this mum here, and that one for that one's just that's the nipple tip being compressed. So signs of poor attachment are nipple pain that continues beyond a minute, a compression stripe. Here you can see this mum's got a compression stripe there. The baby's been latched on. Um, Shallowly, she's also got a piercing mark there as well from previous piercing. Um, excessive breast movement. If we've got lots of breast movement, the baby may not be latched on properly. Chin far away from the breast. Again, we want that baby nuzzled right in. We want um, symmetrical contact on the breast. Dimpling or sucking in of cheeks. I often um, will hear a, um, a mother or even health care practitioner say, oh, um, you know, the baby's doing that it's sucking really well. If we've got dimpling in of the cheeks, we're actually not latched on properly. Um, little or no swallowing herd. Now we can't rely on swallowing, okay, because babies can gulp, gulp, gulp and look like they're doing an amazing job, but they're masters of foolery. They may not be drinking anything. If mum's not having a milk ejection reflex. Engorgement. Now engorgement is another um, big reason for nipple pain and nipple trauma. More and more we're seeing women that have instrumental deliveries, um, caesarean sections, that might be getting fluid in um, delivery. Often we see mums with really engorged breasts. What do you guys do if you've got a mother with engorged breasts to get the baby on? Express, yep, to help get the nipple out. That can be a really good technique. If it's edema overload or fluid overload, sometimes that can make the edema worse. Um, so you do need to assess whether she's um, in fluid over, well, whether she's got edema. This is a really good technique. So reverse pressure softening. And this is something that is really easy for mum to do. She wants to use her fingers or her thumb or whatever she wants to use. And she just wants to pop pressure on her areola, the back of her nipple, and just shift some of that fluid. And that will help the baby to be able to um, latch on. <coughs> Whatever we do, we need to be teaching mums. We need to be giving them the tools. If they can do a task themselves, if we can empower a mother to do it, then she's going to be able to go on and do it more effectively herself. We can guide and lead and show, but until mum learns it herself, or she, she is the best person to be able to um, achieve her goals. But never underestimate the value that you play as a lactation consultant, as a nurse, as a midwife, 
in what we say and what we do, the power of your words, never underestimate that in your support that you give to a mother. In the beginning, what we do and what we say and the support that we give her, remember that is setting her up for her long time, her, her, the course of her lactation. Okay, so in summary, breast anatomy has changed. The milk is stored in the alveoli. The tongue and the jaw work together to create vacuum at the breast. There's no peristalsis. Early breastfeeding or expressing equals good milk volumes. Frequent drainage of milk is essential for ongoing supply. Again, from um, Adele's uh, presentation, the first 14 to 30 days is important to initiate a good milk supply. Milk volumes are maintained from the end of month one and month six. Support and education are required for all mothers. Okay, any questions? Do we have time for questions now or should we just move on? Okay, sure. Okay, 30 minutes. All right, I'll whiz through this presentation. Okay, so we're going to be talking about um, weight loss, infant weight loss. We're going to be talking about normal weight loss for term and late preterm infants, risk factors, best practice for excessive weight loss, Probably going to skip over um, which mothers, or I might just touch on it quickly because Adele spoke um, about it um, before, which mothers are at risk for lactation failure, and then um, dealing with low supply. Oh. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. So we know that after a baby is born, there's a brief period in the colostral phase when babies do lose weight. It's a normal physiological process. And this is, re this is usually well tolerated by mo most healthy term um, newborns. But we want to know what weight loss is the safest upper limit. When should we be doing something about weight loss and what should we do? Now, this is a Dutch study and they looked at two almost 2,500 neonates, but they looked at 4,500 weight measurements. And what they found was that the lowest weight occurred on day two, and the median weight loss on day two was 6.2%. And then by day three, these babies were already starting to regain some of their weight. And what's happening, or what should be happening on day three? Milk's coming in, so it makes sense. Only 4.1 of the babies in this study lost greater than 10% at day two. So not a, not, when, I, when I read this study, I thought, that can't be right. 4.1%, I see babies all the time. Every baby I see is lost greater than 10%. But we only see the abnormal. We're not exposed to the normal. So it's, it's, it's always reassuring when you see things like that. Oh, my God, there are a healthy cohort of babies that exist. Okay, another study, this one was done in um, Italy. And again, similar, um, similar results, but they, these guys looked at the mean weight loss, not the median. And they found that the, the mean weight loss was 6.7%, and 6% of newborns on their unit lost greater than 10%. In America, this was a huge study. 109,000 newborns born over 30 six weeks that were exclusively breastfed, so a good study for us lactation people. And what they did was they separated the categories into spontaneous vaginal birth and caesarean section. What I do want to say is look at this caesarean rate. This is America. <laughs> I was like, really? Okay. Um, if you're having a baby in America, you want to have a baby at this hospital. But anyway, I shouldn't, I shouldn't judge the American system. Um, but by six hours of birth, after birth, um, difference in weight loss, there was a difference in weight loss between deliveries. And that, you know, it makes sense with all our risk factors. What they found was that by 48 hours, uh, weight loss um, for babies that had more than 10% was 
were seen in 5% of um, spontaneous deliveries, but 10% in caesarean section babies. And by 72% of age, uh, 72 hours of age, weight loss for babies more than 10% had crept up to 25% in mums that had a caesarean section. Now, when we know the risks of the delay of onset of lactation, this all seems plausible. Now, this is a tool that I um, encourage everybody to download. It's called the NEWT tool. Um, it's free, and you can have it on your phone. And basically what it does is it's like a um, Billy Rubin chart. You plot in the baby's um, birth date, the baby's time, and you plot in the weight, and it works out the percentage for you. You don't have to, you don't have to do it. Um, and why I find it helpful is because, you know, if you've had a baby at 3 a.m., and you're weighing the baby again, you may not be weighing it bang on 24 hours or 48 hours, so it really does help you to get the exact percentage. I encourage you to, to, um, to download that talk. In fact, a lot of hospitals in Melbourne now, uh, um, uh, you have to have it on your phone if you're a midwife. So the current guidelines suggest that weight loss of 8 to 10% are considered the safest upper limit for term babies and 7% in the late preterm and early term infant, and that is babies from 37 to 38.6 weeks. I'm going to be talking about um, feeding the late preterm infant in the next presentation, and we'll learn all about why these are a slippery group of babies. So the ABM clinical protocol, now does everybody know about the ABM, um, the Academy of Breastfeeding Medical Medicine clinical protocols? So they are um, a group of doctors and healthcare practitioners that have come together to make these clinical protocols around breastfeeding. They are free, they are online, they are evidence-based. If you're trying to make a practice change, they've done all the work for you. Look them up, there's 20 of them. They've got everything that you need to arm yourself with the evidence to make changes within your, um, within your um, own practice. But what the um, clinical protocol number three suggests is that 10% weight loss, it's not an automatic marker for the need of supplementation, but it is an indicator of infant evaluation. So a baby that has a 10% weight loss, we want to know about them, but they may not necessarily need supplementation immediately. I'll talk about why in a moment. So infants that are at risk of excessive weight loss, we've got our early term and late preterm um, group. We've got babies that are having breastfeeding issues, perhaps because we're not educating mothers or mothers are unaware of infant feeding cues. Now, the big, robust four-kilo baby you're not going to have to teach that mum because that baby's going to scream black and blue until it's fed, but our smaller more petite babies that might just give a little feeding cue, that could be easily missed. Oral anatomy. Now, tongue and lip ties. Huge controversy around tongue and lip ties. We do need to be examining inside babies' mouths. We, we do need to know what's going on inside a baby's mouth. Whether that's treated or not is a completely different story, but we want to know if there's something going on inside that baby's mouth that's going to make it harder for them to feed. Introducing a dummy, knocking off the um, um, feeding cues by giving a dummy can cause breastfeeding issues. And then, of course, separation of illness. And then perhaps fluids in labour. So we've got these studies. This is a summary of the studies that looked at fluids in labour and that what they tried to determine was this safer upper limit. But you can see here... They all looked at different volumes. There was no standardisation of um, how much fluid in labour constituted a baby to be fluid loaded and to have um, an inflated birth weight. And then consequently, when we're weighing them at day three or day two, whichever your hospital does, they've had a mass diuresis and they've weed off that fluid. And then we think, oh gosh, they've lost greater than 10%. They're gonna to need to be supplemented but 
was that really their fluid in, was that really their true weight in the beginning or were they just um, carrying extra fluid on board? So again on this slide, you can see here, three litres, two and a half, less than 1,200, really varied. This hospital in America has implemented um, a change to their routine care. And what they're doing now is that they're, um, they looked at healthy babies and they wanted to know how much fluid affects what we, or how much we then go on to supplement. Is it having an effect on our practice? When a mum is um, receiving fluid in labour, does that have an impact on the baby's weight? They compared su supplementation rate, maximum weight loss, length of stay and peak transcutaneous Billy Rubin, and it was a, respect, a retrospective study, so looking back. And what they found was that when they implemented weighing these babies on day two of life rather than at birth, the overall supplementation rate went from 43.6% to 27.4%. So massive changes. And the supplementation rate in primates went from 51.9% to 31%. And infants losing greater than 10%, the supplementation rate decreased from 63.9% to 26.2%. And these babies were all healthy and well. <coughs> there was no significant increase in maximum weight loss, peak transcutaneous bilirubin level or length of stay overall in those with above 10% weight loss from birth. So what is best practice for it? <laughs> There's a lot of monkey pictures in my um, presentations. Now, if we saw that situation, we probably would be a little concerned, but that baby looks pretty happy. We can't see the mum. Um, what is best practice for excessive weight loss in the healthy term infant? Now, we need to know the full facts, okay? We need to go armed in when we're talking to our paediatricians, our obstetricians, whoever is making the call for supplementation, we need to give them the total picture of what's going on. We need to know what is the um, actual percentage of weight loss. Is it 10%? Is it 10.4%? Or is it 12%? Is it 12.9%? What is exactly going on to with that baby. If we just ring up and say, oh, hey, we've got this baby, it's lost greater than 10%, it doesn't say much to the practitioner. We also want to know what stage her, lact her lactogenesis is. So we've got a baby that's lost 10.4%. I've been with the mother. We've gone through expressing. Mum's just expressed 11 mils. We're topping that baby up. The baby's feeding 8 to 12 times in a 24-hour period. Things are, things are looking okay. We may have time to sit and wait. We may have time. She needs to be managed and she needs to be, um, you know, we need to be working with a plan with her. But perhaps that baby doesn't need the supplementation. But if we've got the baby with the same weight loss, we've spent time with the mum, she's got risk factors, and let's face it, all mums have risk factors these days, but if you've spent time expressing and she's doing all the right things and she's getting a glisten of, of um, colostrum, then that baby is going to need supplementation. There's something happening with that mum's milk supply and we need to support the baby. So we need to be careful about formula, but we do need to give it when it's medically indicated. We can't be denying babies of um, nutrition. We also want to know, what's going on for mum? Has she got damage? Is she reluctant to put that baby to the breast? Is it painful? Is it hurting? Is she missing those feeding cues? Has she got a late preterm baby that's not giving these feeding cues? We want to know what her stooling, or the baby's not her stooling. We don't want to, well, midwives probably want to know about. I don't want to know about what her stool is doing. We want to know what the baby's stooling and urine output is doing. 
We want to know how much she's expressing, if she's expressing. We want to know her history. We want to know, has, some, has the baby had a traumatic delivery? These things, taking a good history, will be the make or break of whether that baby gets supplemented or not. And this is what the ABM protocol is talking about. Just because the baby's hit 10% weight loss may not necessarily need, mean that that baby needs to be supplemented, but it needs... It, it needs a plan in place. So, basic management plan for the term infant is skin-to-skin -skin contact, teaching feeding cues, minimise separation. Don't send the baby to the night nursery overnight. <laughs> Good. A lot of hospitals do, and a lot of hospitals in the private sector, I'm going to go out on a limb here, there's an expectation that they have one, okay? Not a good setup for breastfeeding. I used to work in a private hospital, so I feel like I can say that. Um, we wanna make sure that we're breastfeeding a minimum of eight times in a 24 hour period. And you're gonna hear us saying that a lot today, and you already have, but we can't stress it en enough. Frequent stimulation, frequent emptying of those breasts equal more milk, more milk synthesis. We want to get away from saying three hourly because what happens is if we've got a mum who is expressing three hourly, she thinks that she has to wait three hours before she can express again. And we now know it's about the stimulation, not the time frame that she um, needs to express in. So often I'll go into a hospital and I'll, I'll meet with a mum and I'll say, oh, good morning, Mrs Jones, I'm Christy. I'm here to help you with your breastfeeding. Um, would you like to go through some express, expression, expressing and we can have a look and um, I can give you some tips and maybe we can work out a plan. And they often say, oh, no, I just expressed an hour ago. I'm not due to express again. My breasts need to fill up. And then, you know, explaining to that mum that actually, no, our breasts are always making milk and it's about removing that milk from the breast. It's about stimulating your breasts. You don't need to wait that three hours We've got to get this um, stimulation happening. We can actually go through expressing now if you want to. Um, the other thing that allows mum to have that gap overnight, if she's desperately in need of sleep, and let's face it, all new mums are, she can have that five-hour window period of sleep. And when you say that to a mum, OK, I want you to be expressing eight to 12 times in a 24-hour period, but let's work it so you can do um, express, you can express, you know, at 8 o'clock, 8.30, 10.30, whatever you, you, know, you decide, whatever plan you think will work with that, or that mum will um, tell you that will work with her, and you say to her, you're going to be able to have a five-hour window period of sleep if your baby also is an active participant in this plan as well. Um, you know, bring that on. I'm going to, I'm going to try um, and get that sleep. And we know that sleep impacts mood, so we want to be promoting these mums to rest as much as they can. We also want to consider switch feeding when it's appropriate. So switch feeding is when a baby is on one side and if mum's got little milk, when that baby's finished stimulating and has got a bit of milk and perhaps that milk stops flowing, the baby will fall asleep and stop sucking. But what's happened in the other breast while she's been feeding on this breast? She's had a letdown on that side. So switching the baby to that side then there's a milk available for that baby to have. And then we might want to do it again because when the baby's on that side, she might have had another letdown on that side. But if we've got babies that are experiencing greater than 10% weight loss, we don't want this to continue and continue and continue. So because this mum is still going to have to express, we're still going to have to top the baby up, She's going to be triple feeding, so we don't want it to be going, you know, out to at, you know, an hour plus feed, 30 to 40 minutes of this um, switch feeding, then expressing, then topping the baby up. And that's going to be, you know, that's already a big um, workload for that mum. And we need to consider the, the need for formula. The baby needs it, we need to give it. If we've got donor human milk, let's give that. So how much do we supplement the healthy term infant? And it's a lot less than we actually um, give. 
What are your hospital policies? What do you start at um, if you're supplementing a, a baby? 60 mils per kilo per day? 60 to 80? 60 to 90? That's pretty standard. This is um, from the ABM protocol. Again, evidence-based. This is what you can go armed in. So the first 24 hours, 2 to 10 mils. And then when we're getting up to days 3 and day 4, 30 to 60 mils. Okay, so much less than what we give. Because we want the baby to be able to have the hunger cues to be able to stimulate the breast. If we're chocking these babies up full of food, guess what's going to happen? They're not going to feed. So the constant feeder. Now, this is also something that we hear about a lot. The baby that is cluster feeding or is always at the breast. Now, day two. What happens on day two for those, mid for those of us that are midwives? All hell breaks loose. Yeah? Mum's exhausted. Day one, you know, the baby's born, masses of oxytocin, prolactin release, the baby's fed, it's had a good, that four meal of milk. They both have a bit of a rest. Day two, hello, I'm hungry. Feed, 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 feed. I'm stimulating my breasts, or your breasts. I'm switching on the supply. So this is normal newborn behaviour. Cluster feeding is normal newborn behaviour, but it should warrant an evaluation. If we've got a mum that is continually needing to have the baby on the breast, we want to be talking to that mum and finding out what's going on. Is there something going on with the baby? Is there something going on with the initiation or the coming in of her milk supply? Or is there something going on with both of them? Or is this normal behaviour? Does the baby have pain? Is there something going on with this baby? Do we need to give it some pain relief? Has it had a forceps delivery? Is it you know, has it got a great big um, kaput on its head that's painful? The research shows us that rooming out for maternal fatigue does not improve mother's sleep time and reduces breastfeeding exclusive, exclusivity. Okay, so I might just... Oh, no, we've got enough time. Um, ABM clinical protocol number 10, feeding the late preterm infant. We want to initiate breastfeeding within the first hour, like any baby. If the infant is separated, we want to begin expressing within the first one to three hours. And you'll see this changing in all the literature because the evidence is now there. What Adele was talking about earlier with the ad lag, um, the, the six hour, we've now um, su superseded that um, evidence. It's no longer relevant. We need to be doing it within the first one to three hours of birth. Again, feeding no longer than uh, a minimum of 8 to 12 times in 24-hour period. Expression after feeds, double pumping. We need to be double pumping. We want to be topping these babies up with express breast milk after every breastfeed. So this is a big workload for mum. We need to supplement when medically indicated. Teach feeding cues. Skin to skin, again, it's imperative. We want to evaluate any weight loss that's above 7% on day three. When, when do you weigh your babies? Do you do weighing at birth? Day five. Birth and then day five. Fabulous. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. That is awesome. So you will probably find that your supplementation rate potentially would be lower than these studies. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? Right, okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if evidence of ineffective milk transfer, we want to consider nipple shields. Nipple shields improve milk transfer um, on these late preterm babies. We don't need to be afraid of nipple shields anymore. The evidence is there is that they help with our late preterm babies and our um, premature babies. We want to consider pre and post feeding test weights daily or after some breastfeeding. Now, I'm going to talk about that in the next presentation, so I'm not going to go too far into that. But 
we must have a standard feeding plan or protocol for late preterm infants within our maternity units. How much do we supplement them? And again, on day one, five to 10 meals per feed and 10 to 30 meals thereafter. All infants must be formulated. <laughs> again, if we saw this picture, you know, mum with a red face and red boobs. These are macaques. This is Katie Hindi's work. All infants must be formally evaluated for position, latch and milk transfer before the provision of supplemental feedings. So all babies that are having problems need a plan and need review. And we want to follow these babies up. We also want to be telling the par these parents that are triple feeding that this isn't going to last forever. You know, you're not going to be triple feeding this baby forever. It may be two weeks, it may be three. For the late preterm baby, it might be six or seven weeks. But over the coming days, weeks, it's going to, your milk supply is going to increase, the baby's going to mature, it's going to be able to feed better. This isn't going to happen forever. Babies that have um, weight loss greater than 7% for preterm, uh, for late preterm, Greater between 8 and 10% for term babies. We want to continue to weigh them 24 hour, 48 hourly, until that weight starts improving. We want to look at their output and we want to, as, as they improve, we want to reduce the supplementation slowly. So, again, letting that parent know that if you've had to supplement, it's not the end of the world. We're going to get you up to full feeding. As your milk supply increases, we're going to back off with the supplementation. And same with the switch feeding. We're going to go from switching to switching to being able to breastfeed normally, if breastfeeding normally exists. Okay, so expected weight gain. We want to see babies, a healthy newborn baby, putting on around 30 grams a day and around 150 to 200 grams per week. Poor weight gain is considered less than 20 grams per day and we need to determine what kind of problem it is. Is it from the mum? Is it from the baby? Or is it a combination of both? And we want to put a plan in place um, for these situations. Most babies, after that initial physiological weight loss, are back to their birth weight by day 14. And I think it's 95% of babies are back to their weight, um, their no, sorry, 75% of babies are back to their birth weight at day 14. And then by three weeks, all of them should be back to their birth weight, if not surpassing it. If we've got any issues along the way, if you get to a baby at day 14 or even day 10 and they're not starting to look like or they're continuing to lose weight, it warrants a medical evaluation. They must be evaluated. There could be something metabolic going on. There could be something that we don't know about. Stools and urates. Um, urates um, and stools are often a question that we get asked about. It is important, <laughs> it is important for a breastfed baby to have regular stools. What goes in must come out. We want to see a minimum of one to stools um, per day. And this normally persists for around four to six weeks and then the stalling pattern may change and then the stalling pattern may go to a more, um, I guess, an adult-like stalling pattern for want of a better um, analogy. So they may not go three or four times a day. They may go once a day and they might go every few days and that may, may be normal for that baby. But I often hear breastfed babies, it's normal for them to not poo for up to 10 to 14 days it's not that normal. We want to know about it. It possibly could be normal for that baby, but we need to know about it, okay? Definitely not in the neonatal period. The first 28 days of life, they need to be pooing frequently, minimum of one to two per day. And we want to see it changing from that meconium by day four. We want to see it transitioning to that yellow seedy mustard colour because what's happening on you know, days three and days four. Milk's coming in, that's an indication that supply is appropriate. So urates. Now, urates are normal until around day four. 
It's they're, de they're uric acid crystals, but if it occurs after day four, or if we've got weight loss, or if we've got other risk factors, it can be an indicator of um, small volumes of urine or not getting enough milk. <laughs> so again, we want to be alert, not alarmed, but if it's persisting past day four, absolutely we need to be doing something about it. Okay, I'm going to flick through this. We talked about this in the last presentation. I just want to quickly talk about obesity. We don't have much time left. So obesity is a massive lactation risk. And one in four women are now obese or considered with a um, BMI over 30. And these women have 13% lower breastfeeding initiation, so choosing not to breastfeed at all. And they're 20% more likely um, to have a... Um, a 20% decreased likelihood of any breastfeeding at six months. 35% of women aged 25 to 35 in Australia are now overweight or obese. Now, why does obesity affect breastfeeding? And there are mechanical reasons. So, you know, we've got a larger lap area. Mums may need to pop their baby. They might have large breasts. They might need to pop their baby down in a different feeding position it may just be harder to get that baby into a position. We've got the delayed onset of lactation <coughs> after three days. We've got other things going on potentially with obesity. We might have polycystic ovarian syndrome. We might have the increase of androgens, which are male hormones. We might have thyroid dysfunction and the psychosocial factors with being obese in today's society. Now, any diabetes or insulin resistance in pregnancy is associated with a 2.6-fold risk of low milk supply within the first three months of postpartum. And a lot of mums are now having gestational diabetes. It's our largest um, diabetes um, occurrence in Australia. So along with that comes insulin resistance. So insulin receptors... Now, and this is again a, a new or a, an emerging um, field that they, I mean, we've always known about this, but we're learning more and more about it. Insulin receptors increase the milk cells, increase in the milk cells during lactogenesis. So they're building up. And insulin facilitates glucose into the milk cell, so it helps it synthesize milk. What happens is if we've got insulin resistance or a decreased insulin, the lactocytes may struggle to produce milk. So we've got this cascade event, uh, cascading course of events with obesity. We've got a multitude of things that are making it harder for this mum to breastfeed. Okay. So what do we want to look at when we're doing an antenatal checkup? We want to be talking about breasts. We want to be asking mums about breasts. We want to be examining her breasts if she gives us permission. We want to know her history. We want to know past um, birth history. Is she stressed? What's happened? What's going on? Has she had multiples? Is she looking at a preterm delivery because of her multiples, potentially? Does she have any other comorbidities? If so, these mums are at risk of... Um, low milk supply, and we need to give them more support. We need to do this antenatally. Okay, I might just skip past that. I just, just want to show you this mum here. So these are the mums that I was talking to you about <laughs> that when we go into a consultation and then we're faced with a mother that has breasts like this and nobody has spoken to her about what may or might not happen to her breastfeeding journey. This is always heartbreaking because I'm the one that has to say to her, you have the appearance of hyperplastic breast tissue. It appears to me that you may not have the glandular tissue that you're going to need to come to full supply. And then we've got to go into the counselling aspects of managing that mum's expectations and her emotions. Um, but also then putting a plan in place to help support her achieve the maximum amount of milk that she can make. And any milk is great. 
Okay, so 40% of Australian women say low milk supply was the reason that they stopped breastfeeding before, four, uh, before six months. And we can help reduce this number by being aware of who is at risk and how to best support her. 96% of Australian mothers initiate breastfeeding, so the intent is there. Okay. I'm just going to skip with, um, because we're running out of time. So the biggest reason, or the most cited reasons for using artificial formula from birth is because they've previously been unsuccessful or they've had the wrong information. And alarmingly, so my partner can share feeding. Okay, still 29%. And frighteningly, frighteningly, infant formula is as good as breast milk. So in summary, weight loss of 6 to 8% is the norm for healthy term babies. 10% weight loss needs evaluation, but it does not always mean artificial formula is necessary. We need to have a clear clinical picture of mum, baby and their lactation. We want our late preterm babies to have extra support and early EBM supplementation. Mothers of late preterm babies need realistic feeding plans and ongoing support. Antenatal alerts for higher risk women is essential. <coughs> Discussion around breast tissue development and antenatally and breastfeeding history is also essential. Delayed onset of lactation has long term and potentially devastating effects on milk volume effects. And the support that a mother gets in the first month is essential for a good future milk supply. Okay, thank you. So I think the doctors I think the doctors have arrived. So back here. In one back here in an hour. Even just out to the so sorry, just before you go, we'll come back at 1.30, which is yeah. one hour's we'll time. We'll be at, yeah. Okay, welcome back, everybody. We might make a start because we do have a time frame to um, crack on with. So um, I hope you all had an enjoyable lunch and that you're recharged for the afternoon. So this is the last presentation that I'll be um, giving and... Um, no doubt will be um, sick of hearing my voice by the end of the presentation. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the late preterm and the complex baby. Now, some of the information is going to cross over to what we've previously discussed. Um, so I may fit, flip through some of the, um, the slides, um, just depending on how we're going for time as well. Okay. Okay, so almost three quarters of preterm births are born um, between 34 to 36 plus six weeks of gestation. And the late preterm group, they are actually the fastest growing cohort of premature infants. So they're our biggest group that we see. And often these babies are cared for on the maternity ward. Um, is that the case in the, your experience? Mixed? depends on how the baby obviously is going as well. But they're a really slippery group of babies because when we look at them, we expect them to behave like a term baby. Um, and often, very often, they fall through the cracks. And we see this again and again and again. So the preterm birth rate continues to rise. And this is due to demographic changes, infertility treatments. More and more people have access now to fertility treatments that once potentially couldn't. And this is increasing our maternal age. We're having more multiple births and also with our increasing um, obesity rates as well. And obviously there's maternal comorbidity as well. Th these all contribute to the increased rate of um, preterm birth. So up until 1995, we referred to these babies as early-term babies. And actually, we know that they're not early-term babies. They are an individual cohort of babies that require specialised care. We saw significantly increased rates of morbidity and mortality when we cared for them as early-term babies. 
And the mortality rate for a late preterm baby is three times higher risk than a term baby. And this is extraordinary when we think of what we expect from them and how we care for them. Okay, so we're going to um, be looking at Zach here. Zach is a late preterm infant. Um, he was born at 35 plus 5 weeks. Why is Zach likely to struggle, especially on the maternity ward? Any reasons? Temperature and stability. What? Poor feeding. Big one. Yep. Yeah. So all the really common things that we see um, again and again in our practice. Why is feeding a challenge for Zach? Yep, absolutely. Tired? I'm searching for... Who said that? Oh, yep. Yep, absolutely. So physiologically immature? Yes, subtle feeding cues, big one. Excellent. Anything else? That is a really, really big one. If we are caring for these babies on the maternity floor, we do need to have the staff ratios because these babies take more time and it is a consideration that needs to um, be taken into account. I've just lost a signal on here. I don't know if that means that people have gone. But they can stare. They're waving? Okay, cool. We'll crack on then. Okay. How is Zach different neurologically and physically to a term baby? Yeah, absolutely. So haven't had that um, maximum brain growth. Any other reasons? Yes, we haven't had the, the doubling of the internal mucosa in the gut. Absolutely. So we've got a setup for hypoglycemia, a big setup for hypoglycemia with the um, reduced brown fat reserves. Great. Okay, how, well, we actually, we've just touched on that, so I'll, I'll move on from that one. So with our brain development, a third of our brain volume is acquired from 32 to 40 weeks gestation. And the immature brainstem impacts on upper airway and lung volume control, laryngeal reflexes, and chemical control of breathing and sleep mechanisms. We often see this group of baby babies having severe apneas that, if not monitored, can lead to catastrophic events. They have, in, they have reduced ability to move through their wake-sleep cycles well, so they might be trying to wake up to signal for a feed, but they can't do it appropriately because they're neurologically um, premature. 10% of late preterm babies have severe apnea of prematurity. They also have physiological and neurological immaturity. They might have an ineffective latch due to underdeveloped buckle pads, which is what we touched on earlier poor sustained intraoral vacuum, and we know that we need that intraoral vacuum for effective milk transfer. Again, the poor signalling of hunger cues. They might be so subtle. They might be moving of a finger. They might not be these robust movements that the term baby um, shows us. And if we don't have these, or care for these pre late preterm babies in skin-to-skin -skin contact, if the baby signals to us and we miss that cue, then that baby may not have that opportunity to feed. So if mum's got Bubby on her chest and she's busy doing something else, I don't know, maybe she's reading a book or on her phone, and the baby starts to squirm, she'll be like, oh, hello, you're waking up. And then she'll pop baby down to the breast. So really subtle cues. Again, they have difficulty regulating their alertness and they have decreased stamina, exactly like you've all um, explained. 
they have an increased risk of readmission because of all these reasons. <laughs> they also display a really wide variability in individual breastfeeding skills. So you might have the one late preterm baby who can effectively feed and seems to go on and feed well, whereas we, have, we might have others that, you know, they're just at the stage of having a lick and a nuzzle at the breast and that's all that they can achieve for now. They might have significant problems initiating and maintaining breastfeeding and they might have special needs. Close follow-up is essential for these babies and close regular monitoring. Late preterm breastfeeding rates. There's a reduction in the rate of breastfeeding and express milk intake compared with full-term and early preterm babies. And this is a really interesting um, consideration. The early preterm babies often do better at breastfeeding than our late preterm cohort. And why do you think that might be? Absolutely. The early preterm babies, we recognise that they're probably going to need support, so that support is put in early for them. Again, we, we often consider the late preterm baby or the early term baby as a term baby and expect it to behave accordingly, so they slip through the cracks. So we know that by, from looking at hospital discharge um, data, so when we talk about 96% of Australian women initiating breastfeeding, that is one breastfeed at birth. And then the, the, um, the rates dramatically reduce. Neonatal data, on discharge of a baby, there's a tick box. Have they breast, are they breastfeeding or are they formula feeding? Now breastfeeding for that data is one breastfeed. So we don't know what's going on for the rest of the time. Is that baby receiving 10% of its feeds from the breast and the rest from formula? There's a real um, need for better data collection throughout the whole, the whole world, not just Australia. So we know that 60% of late preterm babies initiated breastfeeding or had some breastfeeding at discharge, but only 3% of them were actually exclusively breastfeeding. And at one month, 60% exclusive breast milk, only 23% exclusively breastfeeding. So we know what happens with these babies is that they, they, they do find it harder to maintain and sustain breastfeeding. Preterm infants do not just get it and start breastfeeding unless there is good ongoing breastfeeding support. These infants are at risk of failure to latch and breastfeed. Often we'll hear... Um, or certainly in my experience in the neonatal ward. Um, oh, okay, right. Yeah. Um, we'll hear that, you know, when your baby gets to term, the lights will suddenly come on and, you know, you often get to go home around their term date. And this may be well and true for some babies, but for a large cohort of these babies, that's not true. And if we give that information, if we give the incorrect information to our parents when they get to their term date and their late preterm babies aren't doing what we've told them that they're going to do, we're setting them up for disappointment and perhaps stopping breastfeeding. So this was a study um, done in Australia, a long longitudinal study of Australian children or their LSAC study, and they looked at 4.9% of, uh, they looked at um, 5,000 children aged less than 12 months. and. 4.9% of these babies were preterm, mostly late preterm babies. And what they found, again, was that this group, 35 to 36 weeks, their breastfeeding rates were much poorer than the other groups. So here we've got the dotted line, less than 34 weeks, doing better. They're now 35 to 36 week group. There's also risk factors involved with late preterm babies. They're four times more likely to be diagnosed with jaundice, respiratory distress, poor feeding, temperature instability, hypoglycemia, suspected sepsis. Pretty much all of those that we talked about before. Breastfed infants, more likely to be readmitted than formula fed largely attributed to insufficient breast milk intake. Okay, so those babies that are going home on formula are getting the intake that they need 
in this preterm, a late preterm cohort. So we need to have a plan in place for these babies when they're being discharged. Is that surprising to anybody, that information? No, that's something that you've heard before? Okay, so we won't talk too much about this because we have talked about the importance of the first month and the critical window period. So we want these mums of preterm babies or late preterm babies to be able to have the ability to initiate, build and maintain their supply for their babies. And again, what we do in this time frame will set them up for lactation success or make it really difficult for them to be able to activate their cells. Now, when we have a mum who does partially activate her breast cells, and you might think of those, um, those women that choose not to breastfeed initially or co for cultural reasons, they may choose to not give their baby colostrum, and then they go on to have a full supply, and you think, okay, well, how does that work in with everything that we've learnt today? But actually, what we were talking about earlier with that you cannot tell how many breast-making cells a woman has by looking if a mum has a million breast cells and she's only activating half of them, she might be fine to, have, to then go on to have um, an, enough milk for her baby. But if you're the mum that has 100,000 milk-making cells and you're only switching on 50,000 of them, then the chances are, ooh, um, the chances are that you're going to have a really hard time getting those cells up and functioning if you miss this window of opportunity. And there are many, many things that we can do to help boost this milk supply, but it takes commitment and hard, hard work from that mother. So if we get it right in the beginning, then it's going to be much easier for the rest of her lactation journey. Okay, so some challenges with feeding support for preterm infants. They have short hospital stays. So we've got less time to implement these plans and support their breastfeeding. Readmission is more likely and it's disruptive to the feeding process. They go home without feeding plans or going home with a feeding plan with their triple feeding without the parents being informed that this isn't going to last forever. Parents get overwhelmed. It is exhausting. Triple feeding is hard, hard work. And then often they're advised to bottle feed instead of breastfeeding to monitor milk volumes. So we need to shift our thinking from normal breastfeeding management. And we need to be letting these mums know that effective suckling often takes some time to become established. So we're looking at weeks here. We're looking at maybe six weeks, and that's not abnormal for a late preterm baby. If we set mums up with this knowledge, then when they get to their term date and the baby's not feeding well, they don't think there's something wrong with them or something wrong with their supply. They know that this perhaps is a normal course of lactation for a late preterm baby and I need to continue on for a few more weeks and then over those weeks, things will get easier and the plan will change. Okay, so we talked about the basic care path for the late preterm infant in the last presentation, but I'll just quickly touch over it again. Initiate breastfeeding within the first hour if you're separated from the baby. Feeding three hourly, no longer than four hourly. And remembering that's not a rigid, we want to feed or express every three hours. That's a minimum of three hours. Three, you, know, you don't want to go longer than that for this baby. Double pumping. Expression after feeds, topping up with EBM after every breastfeed, supplementing when medically indicated, teaching cues to all parents, skin to skin, and monitoring for weight loss. If it's above 7% on day three, we need to look at these babies. We need to investigate what's going on. If there, evidence, if there is evidence of ineffective milk supply or milk transfer, we want to consider the use of nipple shields. We'll be talking about those more in a moment. Consider pre and post feed test weights daily or after some breast feeds. Now, test feeds. Do you do test weighing in your um, clinical practice? No. 
So, when I very first started in the NICU, we used to test weigh babies, and it was a disaster. We would, we would, feed, we would weigh the babies before they had a feed, would write down the amount that they weighed, the baby would then feed at the breast, and then we would weigh them again. And we know that the grams that the baby has increased equates to the amount of meals that the baby has taken on. So back then, 20 years ago, the scales were so inaccurate. We had one set of scale per, for the whole nursery. We were moving scales around. Weights got lost. So test weighing became a really ineffective way of measuring um, how much a baby actually took from the breast. But we now know that test weighing is actually the only accurate way of measuring how much milk a baby has taken at the breast. So when we talk about milk in the NICU, what's your current... How do you decide how much... Um, if a baby's had a breastfeed, how, how do you decide how much a baby will be topped up if it needs to be topped up? Yep. So we we so we're guessing. Yeah. So we're looking at um, how long they're fed for. Now we know that how long a baby feeds for is no indication of the milk ejection reflex that the babies had. Sucking. We know that they can be sucking and appear to be swallowing and not getting anything. Now, do we measure everything else in the NICU? We measure urine output. We measure weight, we measure how much um, fluid a baby gets. We measure absolutely everything that we do. So why do we not use evidence-based practices when we're deciding on how much to top up a baby? So test weighing now with our that our scales that are accurate to one gram, they provide this evidence for us. And this is now in the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. And you see um, practice changes with test weighing coming back in, but we've got many, many scales, we've got accurate scales, and the parents are taking control of their weights. So they are the ones that are popping their babies onto their scales. The scale doesn't move anywhere, it stays with that mum. She feeds that baby, then she weighs the baby, and however many grams the baby has gone up is how many meals the, um, the baby has taken. And then that tells us how much we need to top up the baby. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay, and we need to develop a standard feeding plan for late preterm infants. Okay, again, many, um, how much to supplement the late preterm infant? Less than we, we think. So day one, five to 10 meals, and then 10 to 30 meals thereafter. And remembering that this is evidence-based. So if you... Um, There are a lot of scales on the market now that... Um, <coughs> it is a very... I mean, it is the only accurate way of, um, you know, not guessing, taking the guesswork out of it. So, But there are many, many scales on the market that you can buy that are accurate to one gram. Yeah. So, um, historically, there were about 20 to 30 grams out. And if you think, you know, a, a preterm baby might only take... Um, 20 mils at the breast, so that equates to 20 grams, then they would be getting a full top-up, but they've taken 20 mils. And what's going to happen to that baby the next time it's feed, like it's showing um, cues to feed? Or is it going to show cues to feed because it's so full from being over-topped up? What? And then they vomit, and then, you know, and we're, we get ourselves into a bit of a pickle. Okay, so let's not forget the early term infant born between 37 to 38 plus um, six weeks. These babies are also at higher risk um, than full term for hyperbilirubinemia, hospital readmission, reduced breastfeeding initiation and duration. And those born via elective caesarean are at increased risk for respiratory problems, TTN, neonatal unit admission, sepsis, and hypoglycemia is, um, requiring treatment. Now, these infants have now been included into the late preterm care plan by the ABM. So they've now been 
considered in their, um, the late preterm cohort. So it may be that we're seeing these babies as late as 37 to 38 week gestation being set up for um, breastfeeding issues. So when we monitor the late preterm infant, we want to communicate the feeding plan clearly. We want to continue to express and top up after feeds until a consistent good weight gains and outputs are achieved. We want to consider delaying discharge until these things are happening, until there's an effective feeding plan in process. We want to talk to parents about minimising unnecessarily handling. So not, not touching their babies. In fact, we want the baby in skin-to-skin -skin contact for as long and possible as we can throughout the day and night, if safe. But we want to be talking to them about passing the baby around and the energy that is required when we've got copious visitors. And we need to be careful in the way that we talk to parents. I, you know, working in the NICU, I often hear, you know, minimal handling. You can't touch your baby because if you wake your baby up, it's going to um, expend energy and it's not going to grow, yada, yada, yada. But... That's not the message we want to be sending our mums. We want to be telling them that you are vital to your baby's care. Your touch is going to help your baby to grow. But these are the ways that we can do it so that they minimise the expen energy expenditure that they're going to be exhibiting. We want to assess and document breastfeeding and EBM volumes expressed and how much the baby's taken. We want to monitor their vital signs their weight at 48 hours and their output and input. And we want to set them up with community breastfeeding supports before they go home, pre-discharge. Some techniques to help milk transfer are feeding positions that we've talked about um, earlier today. Breast compression. Does everybody know what breast compressions are? I mean, it's fairly self-explanatory. As the baby is suckling, when the baby stops sucking, if you compress your breast by gently squeezing, you always want to be gentle with the breasts, then that will help um, the milk to be ejected a little bit more and the baby will continue drinking. And as the baby then starts to drink, then you can take the compression off. And then when the baby slows down again, you compress the breasts again. This can be a really, really effective way of getting more milk out to the baby and the use of nipple shields. I'm going to talk a little bit more about nipple shields in a moment. So with these babies, we also want to think about careful positioning so that we do avoid chin to chest, causing apneas, bradycardia and desaturations. We want to support their low tone. We want to make sure that they maintain their airways to avoid airway obstruction. So avoiding positions that cause ex excessive flexion of their trunk and their neck. The traditional cradle hold, as we mentioned earlier, it's, it may not always be recommended for these babies. It may make it potentially difficult for them to maintain their head control and they're most, most likely to have lower tone. So without adequate support, the infant will slump and it'll make it difficult to maintain latch and transfer milk and also occlude airway and causing the um, apnea bradys and desats. So here's the, um, the, the video that I mentioned earlier showing this baby in the laid back feeding position. So this mum was having breastfeeding difficulties and she allowed her baby to latch on um, in this innate breastfeeding position. And if you watch it online, it's, it's really amazing, just the joy in this mum's face of finding something that actually worked for her. It allows the baby to switch on its innate instincts. It's easy to do in skin-to-skin -skin contact. Mum's usually laid back in that position anyway, so the baby just bobs its way down from the chest and latches itself on. And it's helpful for those babies with receding chins. Another support that we can do is the dancer hold. Now this is really, really good for babies with um, low tone. So we're coming underneath the breast, we're supporting the breast tissue and the baby's cheek, we're helping them create that intraoral vacuum. 
It's really good for babies with um, Down syndrome. It's a really effective way of getting a baby um, to stay latched on and maintain a latch. And you can also do this dancer hold position with a bottle as well. Um, a really good, um, effective way of helping that baby maintain its latch. Breast compressions, again, can aid sustained suckling, can increase milk transfer and can improve vacuum. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, nipple shields. Now, there's a bit of a, um, a fear, I suppose, when it comes to nipple shields. So there's, I often hear two, two trains of thought. They're never, ever handed out or they're given to everybody for every reason. We need to be somewhere in the, in the middle. So the nipple shields used to show that they reduced um, the, they, or they delayed the onset of lactation because of what they were made out of. They were thick, they were rubbery. But now they're made out of a really, really thin silicon. The, the mother's um, still able to sense the baby suckling on her nipple. Um, they're really, really good for babies that come on and off the breast. So um, regardless of whether you're preterm or your term, if you've got flat nipples... If, you're having, if that baby's having difficulty latching, they can be a really good tool. They really, really help babies, um, preterm babies, to transfer milk. Okay, so they assist preterm babies in the transferring of milk. They help babies with their sustained fatigue and with their low intake. Now, Paula Meyer. Um, one of the researchers in America who is leading in her um, lactation research, she says that correct usage led to less frequent loss of the nipple and better and more sustained milk transfer in preterm infants. And a pool of milk remains in the tip of the shield, rewarding the baby for any compressions or vacuumed exerted. So a really good effective tool to use with this cohort of babies. But... If a mum is using a nipple shield, we need to have a plan in process of her... She's using it for a reason, so we need to be looking at her. We need to be developing a plan of how to get the baby off the shield for when and if the baby can come off the shield. Supply lines. Does anybody in your NICUs use a supply line or on the maternity floors as a tool? Yeah, I can see a few nods. That's excellent. So this is a really, really undervalued um, way of keeping baby at the breast and really underutilised way. In America, they have disposable supply lines in their NICUs, disposable SNSs. Now, Adele is going to talk about the SNS um, later. But essentially what it does is it tops the baby up at the breast. So while the baby's sucking, the milk is being fed through a small supply line and the baby is getting their top up at the breast. Now, this has a two-pronged um, two approach. The baby's getting topped up. But what's happening to the mum? Stimulation. So we're building her supply at the same time. Really, really effective. And we need to be setting realistic expectations for mothers. We need to be working with them to formulate a plan. We need to let them know that the late preterm baby, the immaturity is likely to delay that transition to full exclusive breastfeeding. And again, this can take weeks. We're looking at six to eight weeks for these babies to um, fully achieve breastfeeding. So this is just a little snippet of what um, some mums said when they had um, all plan and no realistic really realistic expectations of normal for a late preterm baby. And this is one mum. So there was like this sucking issue and obviously he wasn't latching really well. It just felt like he was really disorganised, like he couldn't quite coordinate himself to do it. He would have a couple of feeds where he would do well and then he'd have a couple where he was just tired or just, you know, he didn't seem to be able to do it. And then he'd have more of a supplement. Now this is perfectly normal for what a late preterm baby um, we would expect to see. But for this mum, she wasn't told, so she thought there was something wrong with her or something wrong with her baby or her ability to feed her baby. I guess more explanation for us about the feeding, like everybody kind of sent us home on a plan, but nobody really explained to us that this is normal 
and there can be these sorts of issues and um, what to expect. We, we really didn't hear that. Okay, so our messaging is not getting um, to where it needs to be and that's to the parents. So parents need to know time limits of when to expect good feeding, expression and for how long. How long is this going to go for? How long can I cope with this? And topping up for how long? So breastfeeding is natural but not instinctive, nor is it easy in our bottle feeding culture. We need to feed the baby. We need to initiate, build and maintain the mother's milk supply. We need to top up after every feed for a late preterm baby. We need to set realistic expectations and we need to ensure that there's support, 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 pre and post discharge. Now, this is a really um, amazing quote. If breastfeeding did not already exist, someone who invented it today would deserve a dual Nobel Prize in medicine and economics. Breastfeeding is a child's first inoculation against death, disease and poverty, but also in their most enduring investment in physiological, cognitive and social capacity. Okay, so that's where I'll end the presentation on. So did anyone have any questions from any of the previous sessions or from this session now? Um, I'm a midwife on the floor here and a supporter of the ABA and just last year they published a um, breastfeeding using a breastfeeding supplementer guide. So when you talk about community support, this is something that we as healthcare providers can point families to purchase. So online they can download it and it's as cheap as $5 or you can get a hard copy version as well. And the ABA has a 24 hour hotline as well that mothers need to be told before they go home that they've got 24-hour access to counsellors if they're having problems during the night. An invaluable research, uh, resource. The government has just thankfully contributed money to keep that um, support line going. Any other questions? Hi, it's Jenny again. Hi, Jenny. Um, I just had a question with regards to, we know the importance of skin-to-skin -skin contact, and um, I have a Southern African background, and um, they use kangaroo mother care as a way of getting those late preterm babies home earlier. So they're discharging babies at about 1.6 kilos home fully breastfeeding from doing kangaroo mother care um, within their nursery. So the mothers actually live in and establish yeah. that feeding. Is there anywhere in Australia where they're actually practicing that? Unfortunately, no. And this is where the research has started in um, you know, these South African countries with the kangaroo baby mother care. And, and you know, we... Here in Australia, we have these protocols that say, you know, unless you're 32 weeks or you're X or you're Y or you're Z, you really can't go to the breast and suckle and feed well. Now, the information from people like Nils Bergman, who are overseas supporting these um, um, kangaroo mother care um, practices, they show these 28 weekers transferring milk at the breast. We, we need to not underestimate what a baby can do. But again, we need to have them in the right place, we need to have the right supports in process within our hospital systems so that this can happen. But if it can happen in a developing country, then why can't we do it here? All it takes is a cloth around a mum's um, abdomen and the ability for her to stay. Could you explain that the dancer hold a bit more? Yeah, sure. Because so, I, I 
is that something that's been going for a while? Yeah, so it, it, it is. Um, it has been around. You know, it's not a new technique. So essentially, what you're doing is um, you're teaching the mum. So it's really to um, maintain their airway a bit better and help with the muscle, but if the little bit weak in muscles. <clears throat> Hi, um, I'm a midwife that works at the hospital. My name's Lisa. Um, I was just wondering, in all the slides, sort of we talked about the importance of initiating breastfeeding early, especially within that first hour. Um, but I often find that sometimes when you are giving that baby the opportunity to crawl to the breast on their own, they do tend to take longer than that, especially in certain birth situations where, you know, there's has been presence of drugs and an epidural, a traumatic birth where the baby has come out quite sleepy or um, stunned and takes longer to actually get to the breast. Is it sort of more beneficial then to be trying to position the baby to get that earlier feeding or, you know, just leave the baby for that good two hours that it may take for them to crawl yeah, to the breast? Absolutely. It's a, look, it's a really good question and something that you see more and more often with, um, you know, interventions. But we've got that window period. So the most effect, the earliest onset of lactogenesis is, is within one to three hours of birth. So you do have that window period of one to three hours. Certainly, if the baby hasn't fed um, by the three-hour period, then you would want to be looking at um, giving that baby some gentle assistance. And the mum can actually do that. So we don't need to be going in with a hands-on approach. We can just be talking to mum about, OK, so, you know, we're heading up to the three hours. It's really looking like Bubby's still sleeping. Let's try and optimally position Bubby so that they can um, try and latch to the breast and if the baby then isn't interested or is still sleeping or for whatever reason, then absolutely, absolutely we do need to get that mum expressing. You were saying that the um, transitional um, hold is not optimal anymore for breastfeeding. So what is an optimal position? So it, you need to work with the baby and, and really find out what is working well for that baby. Um, laid back feeding, you know, just go, go back to um, thinking about how we are as mammals and the positions that we see other mammals doing. And they're often the best positions that we'll achieve feeding in our own babies in. Yeah. But laid back feeding, good for all babies. Laid, um, laid back, good for late preterm babies, good for preterm babies, good for term babies. With these little tackers in the nursery on their way out, so they're getting a couple of feeds during the day with mum. Mm -hmm. So overnight bottle feeding with a tea. Your yep. thoughts on that? To get them going faster. To get them going home. So the research shows us that babies that are fed with a bottle actually more unstable than a baby that is fed at the breast. So we do need to be careful with how we're, what, what plan we are setting these babies up for um, for going home. 
Um, we don't want to then overwhelm the baby and then they aspirate and then they have to stay longer with a bottle. So the BFA, BHFI recommends cup feeding. Um, not great for larger volumes of milk, but there are other ways that we can feed. So we can finger feed. Um, we've, bottle feeding is our traditional approach, but there are many other methods that we can do in the absence of mum. And, you know, that in, in, in an ideal world, before the baby come, um, comes to going home, we'd have that parent rooming in. So for the 24, 48 hours before they are going home, they'd have full access to the breast. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. So I just want to go through some of the tools in your toolbox to really support, especially these low tone and those um, infants and those late pre-termers that um, might need some extra support in um, uh, by a different method than using a bottle. So one of the things that Christy was talking about was the SNS. And I know that there was a few people that said, yes, we've seen the SNS. Um, and part of my role, and I'm so lucky, when I touch base with a lot of midwives and nurses, they often say, can you just quickly show me how to do this so I don't have to fumble in front of a parent? So this is a really nice way to just go through all the steps of how to put one together, when to use them, um, and that transition from hospital to home. So the supplement nursing system is a feeding method that enables infant to receive the extra milk requirements while still feeding at the breast. So the, um, the particular cohort that benefit most from using an SNS is those mums with insufficient milk supply, infants with extra milk requirements, but you don't want to provide that extra milk via a bottle. Those late pre-termers not able to get a full requirement at the breast, so they're the ones with the lower tone, those uncoordinated sucks. Uh, breastfeeding an adopted or a surrogate baby. So I had the absolute pleasure to meet a woman, two women on uh, the Gold Coast, and they were initiating their supply. And in part of that process and part of the protocol was to actually use a supplement nursing system. Induced or relactation. So the beauty, and this is one of my favourite, favourite Medela products, because it keeps babies where they belong, at the breast. So they get all of their extra top-ups through the SNS. So the top-up is in the bottle, which is attached to these tiny, very, very thin tubes, and that allows, like we were saying before, those infants to be stimulating the breast which really can help boost the, that supply of that, the mother with um, lower, vo uh, lower volumes, while also allowing that infant to keep practicing that new learning behavior. And this is the norm. Putting a bottle and a teat together is not the norm. And we often, I often hear of some babies that will have the one, um, uh, one normal you know, bottle and find it really difficult to then go back to the breast. It's a whole different sucking mechanism. As you saw earlier in uh, Christie's presentation, we know we have to create an intraoral vacuum to physically draw that milk out of the breast. With a conventional teat, how do we normally get the milk? We either press or it just keeps dripping. So some babies, my brother was one of them and I love that, became really lazy. Why should I go back to the breast and have to work for my feed when I know that if I kick up enough of a stink, somebody will give in and give me a bottle? Because I can just even lay there and get the milk that I need. So these, these supply lines obviously um, are used in um, cases where babies have weak suck <coughs> or they can't maintain the vacuum long enough. They still need to be able to create intraoral vacuum because it still works by having that vacuum. It will not drip unless there is a vacuum. 
but it certainly supports those with a lower um, vacuum requirement because with the SNS there's three different flow rates. So it encourages the infant to feed at the breast despite having low supply. So what a lot of mums have said, I had the absolute pleasure of meeting some mums at West End. There was a cafe and there were six of these amazing mothers and they all used the SNS. It was the most touching experience. And two of these mums said, I've got really low supply, but this actually empowers me to keep that baby going. I feel like I'm breastfeeding. And that's how I look at this system. I'm still breastfeeding. Yes, predominantly there was a... She, she used a significant amount of top-up in her bottle. But she said in her mind, she was breastfeeding. And that empowered her to keep going. Used to stimulate mother's production. So you know how we were talking earlier about that suckling and it creates that prolactin response, which therefore aids with, that, um, with the milk production. And so keeping that baby at the breast like we were saying earlier, it's got this like, two-part. It's great for the infant, but it's also really, really good for that stimulation of the mum's um, mom's prolactin. I've certainly heard it being used for suck training. And again, it just reiterates it's a supplementation without the need of bottles and tates. And nurturing mum's confidence in that ability to breastfeed, like I was sharing. Now, supplement medicine systems can sometimes be just a short-term it's just why babies are getting their stuff together. It's just why they're physically growing and getting those buckle fat pads and getting that extra tone. But some of these babies, it's a long-term use. So one of these mums that I, that I met um, was using her supplement nursing system for 12 months. And she was so happy with it. And she found it really, really empowering. So this is a quote from Jack Newman, and it says... Babies learn to breastfeed by feeding. And mothers learn to breastfeed by feeding. But there is so much more to breastfeeding than milk. Having that baby on your breast, we know of all the psychological benefits. And certainly hearing from that mother who was really, she, was, she shared her story of having severe postnatal depression. She shared her story of feeling like she'd been completely let down by her experiences in pregnancy. She had a really traumatic birth. And she said, I was just wanting to be successful at something. And that supplement nursing system kept her going through some really difficult days. So how do we use them? So there's many different parts. You have your bottle, there is a valve holder, and there's three different types of tubing. So you know how I said before, we've, it, it, babies still need to create a vacuum, but even those poor and those low-tone babies, um, they, you, you can pick the flow rate which suits your individual baby. There's the attachment ring that pulls us all together, the neck cord so mums can be comfortable and not have to hold anything, tape to tape these um, tubes to the breast and then a cover just to keep it all together. So how do we use them? So this can be used with EBM and fortified milk or with formula. And the tubings come in three widths. So there's the red, which is the small, the medium, which is the white, and the transparent, which is the large or the faster flow. So has everyone used one of these before? No? So that's the first thing to do is work out which one do we need. Do we need a slower flow or a faster flow? Then you've got a, um, your valve holder, and that keeps everything in place and makes it airtight. So this is the setup that, we would, that you need to, to see for, for the SNS. So, so what you need to do is a couple of things. The shoulder of the bottle in line with the nipple. And this is important, you'll see why, I've got some tips later. You'll attach these two tubes to the nipple, just like this, and then hang it around mum's neck. And that's the setup. What we need to see is a, it's about a centimetre protrusion just here, so that when babies latch, they also have um, the tube within their mouth. And the best positions are here. So at the top roof of the mouth or at the side of the mouth. 
You obviously don't want it under the tongue because then the tongue will get in the way. So once these are set up, the only way that babies can remove the milk, so when these are attached like this, milk will not drip. The only time that milk will physically flow through this is when there's a vacuum. So these babies have to be actively sucking and when babies stop sucking, it reduces the vacuum and the flow stops. So these are safe um, for those, those infants. So there's a couple of tips. The first one is, <clears throat> if the milk is not flowing well, so say you've used a, um, a thickener or um, more of those fortifiers, what you can do is just move, detach this side, and have it up, and it's almost like a snorkel. And that changes the pressure gradient within this bottle and makes it um, flow quicker. So you're not sat there going, oh, no, I've, I've, got a, I've got a white, and I need a red, and now I've got to take the whole thing apart. There's some other things that you can do. And the first thing to, do, to try is to do this if you need to increase the flow rate. The other thing that you can do is, obviously, use the chipper, uh, the thicker tubing next time, but place the bottle higher than the nipple. So you know how I said you have the, the shoulder of the bottle that's in line with the nipple? Just by raising the bottle, we're going to change the pressure gradient and it's going to flow easier. So that's so much easier than faffing around trying to change tubes. Press the bottle, but be very, 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 very careful because we don't want um, to obviously then be causing a, a surge of milk going into um, that infant's mouth. And make sure that you, your milk is always warm. We, we've heard before how sensitive um, um, some of those components of human milk are. So we need to be treating them with respect and making sure that it's warm anyway. So that should be a given. Now, to decrease the flow, obviously you can use a thinner tubing or you can lower the bottle. How easy is that? So if it's too quick, lower the bottle. It will slow the rate down. Contraindications. So... SNS should not be used for any mothers who are unable to breastfeed because of medical conditions. Because when that baby is at the breast, they will likely be taking breast milk. So if they're not supposed to be a breastfeeding baby, this shouldn't be used. Also, mothers that are taking medications which babies are intolerant to, to use. So again, if we don't want that breast milk going um, into baby, then we need to make sure that we don't use one of these. So consideration. So make sure that you prepare and you warm any supplement um, nutrition in a separate milk container because these aren't very stable. When on, we don't want to lose any of that precious milk. So warm your feed, pour it in, and then start putting this together. And to avoid clotting, um, clogging, make sure you fully dissolve powder formula. These tubes are incredibly thin. They're beautiful and they're been designed so, um, and so uh, if you've got any lumps of formula, it can cause clotting, clogging rather. Now there's some amazing support groups out there, and there's this particular one, and it's on Facebook, and it's called, it's a long one, Supply Line Breastfeeders Support Group of Australia. And there's some amazing women, they share their stories and their tips and tricks of how to use the SNS. And sometimes these mothers will get together in a little group, like I was sharing at West End, um, and get together and they, they just make SNS use normal. So I'll quickly show you how to put one together. I'm going to move around if that's okay. I'm sorry for everybody logging in, but I will send everybody the video. So Medella have got some amazing videos online, and one is how to put this together. Because there's nothing worse than what lots of midwives have said, trying to fumble and make um, difficult things. So the first thing you do is work out what suction is. So any flow medium or suction. Once you've done that, you take your um, style folder and you pop it on top. There's only one way it can work. Then all you need to do is this is your collar, get your two tubes, thread it through the collar, pull that out. Make sure it's pushed down. 
And that's the highest part to do. Then what you need to do is use in these tubes. You feel the little lines in these ends? Take the tubes and just put them on the side and that just stops any flow. Any pop to milk. Now what most units will do is they will leave this completely closed. So the baby will go from the breast is firstly going to remove the milk from the breast. Then we'll be feeling really fussy. Mum's had a feeling for milk. She then do the other side. And then once she's ready to identify that top up, um, Take out one of the um, tubes and unclip that, and then that will allow us to open and come through. It's really cool when we get to breakfast, and then when we come back, we do it that way. Also. Any questions that have to be asked? I'm so sorry. I was just wondering how, what's the use by date on each component? On each component, so the tubes, about 30 days. Now you don't have to buy the whole thing again. Mums can just go to the Delta online and buy spare parts, and she'll get set up free. So about a month for the tubes, unless you start to make it, it's an old baby, you know, you're going to be more in what they should be, because that's not they can do about um, make sure you visually inspect to make sure that you know that you can Bottles and other parts, one month uh, in the script, and she's had hers for almost two years. So they last. Now, um, one thing that I often get is, how oh, expensive are these? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I often get asked, well, how expensive are these? And I often say, well, it's about the, about the price of three tins of formula. About 80 bucks. But if that means that that mum gets that baby on that breast and that empowers her and that baby has all that extra sucking at the breast, it's worth its weight in gold. What I would suggest, though, is get mums to try those DIY special care nursery NICU first. You know, the, the ones with the bottles and the really thick NG tubes. If she's happy with that, this is, this is a much better system. Any other questions? How do you sterilize it? It's always a good one. So how you clean them is, as with all breast milk, it's full of fat. So you wash with, um, so the first thing is you rinse with warm water, and then you wash with hot soapy water. And then to flush out the tubing, you fill the bottle with warm soapy water and you squeeze and it forces all of these tubes to become clean. You then use a couple of rinses of hot water or warm water, and then use a couple of air just to try and dry those tubes out. You can sterilise the bottles. You can sterilise all the other parts, apart from tubing, because the tubing is quite delicate. Any other questions? I've never been asked that. I will find out. And I'll let you know before the end of the day. Okay, so I'm just quickly going to go through. I've got 20 minutes. I just want to show you some tips and tricks with contact nipple shields. Beautiful. Okay, so there's other products for other... Um, in, in your toolboxes. So obviously you've got the supplement nursing system. There is also cup feeders. So like Christy was saying, um, BFHI, and the, there's a few hospitals that will use cup feeding instead of using bottles and teats. There is a soft cup feeder, which is this device here. And it's similar design to a cup in the sense that this, the babies will lap from here. Uh, finger feeders, 
Have you seen one of these special? Yep. Yeah. Supplement nursing systems. This is also called a Haberman feeder, and then obviously we've got the SNS. <clears throat> so sorry. Okay, so cups. They've got a small lip to help prevent any spillage, and they're, gra um, they're graduated. So when you're holding one of the Medela cups, you'll see some lines, and that helps then work out how much volume without having to stop the baby from lapping, having a look, and then going back. So there's actually some um, lines just, can you see them just there, to try and help so that that way you can monitor how much milk um, the baby's having. So when to use them. So preterm or weak, or weak infants that cannot either complete a full breastfeed, those neurological impairments to top up when mum's not available, medications, and, temporary, um, and that temporary inability to breastfeed. And conditions of mothers where breastfeed initiation may be delayed. Okay. Short-term use only. I've heard of teaspoons being used. Has anybody seen teaspoons? Yeah. The, one of the concerns that the, a number of LCs have said about cup feeding and teaspoon is sometimes moms will go home and they have this expectation that this is all they're ever going to drink. And then they come back. It happens. I've... I've I know three documented cases um, in southeast Queensland where mums have gone on cup feeding. So this is the quota, this is what you need to do and how much you need to, to provide your baby and then that baby's ended up back at, um, in the paediatric department for failing to thrive. So cleaning, cool water, wash with warm soapy water and then rinse. Soft cup. So again, what this allows babies to do, you can see here, there's only a very small amount of milk available for babies to lap or, or lick. <clears throat> so it prevents flooding, requires very, very little energy, and it's the slightest feeding effort, but it's still rewarded. And it helps reduce spillage of that precious breast milk. When to use. So this is for preterm or infants with very, very weak sucks. You cannot com complete a full breastfeed. Those cleft babies and those with severe pal palate um, issues, those Down syndrome babies, um, and any temporary inability to complete a breastfeed where you only want really small volumes available to that infant. I'm not going to go through this part in the interest of time, but the way that it works is it's a vacuum. So. Um, what you'll do is if you squeeze there, it causes the milk that's in the um, container to fill the reservoir. And then from there, when you squeeze again, there's only, again, it's a small amount of milk that then, um, that's then available um, to the infant. So you can see here, there's 11 mils in this part and only two mils available. I'm starting to see a few um, hospitals start using these. Okay. They're about the same price as a special needs feeder. So to clean, take all the parts apart, rinse with cool water, and then wash with warm soapy water. Finger feeders. So these are designed to put, um, for the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest doses of human milk. So they, they're designed to attach to a syringe, a one to, normally I've seen them used with a one to five mil or three mil syringe. <laughs> Um, and they're very, 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 very soft, <laughs> incredibly soft, and that's just to allow those droplets of milk in that um, oral cavity. <coughs> so when to use? So um, more this very small supplement. So you can see here, this is on a syringe, very, very, very small amounts of um, breast milk. They're for the really weak babies and those with cleft lip and palate. <coughs> Cleaning again, so we take it off the syringe, rinse in cool water, and then flush it with another syringe with warm soapy water. Rinse it again and then um, leave it to dry. Have you seen one of these? Yep. These are amazing. These are absolutely phenomenal for those cleft babies in particular. So designed for infants with feeding difficulties, it's a silicon feeder that 
the teat adjusts for the, the milk flow. So you can see these lines here. And that corresponds to the cut at the top and how much milk flow that, that infant's able to, um, in, uh, to have. And that prevents that infant from getting overwhelmed <coughs> with the milk flow. It works really be well for babies who have got that weak suck or that difficult to, difficult to feed. Is that when you normally use them? Portone, yeah, cleft babies. So we know with cleft babies, I was um, talking with a speech pathologist and she was saying that even with mild cleft babies, because of the air that could be, say, at the top of the nose, at the very, very back, they can't, that extra airflow going into the nasal cavity means that they cannot create a good intraoral vacuum. So even those really, really, really mild cases, she was saying, can have such big impacts on, um, on a breastfeed. So when to use? Again, any infant that can't create and sustain a, a long vacuum. <coughs> oh, I'm so sorry. And these are usually used for long term. So what you can see here, this is the cut and it, how it relates to the lines. So how much milk is able to um, um, go to for the infant. So some tips to remember. Short line, no or very little flow. Medium, for that medium flow. And the longest line has the largest. <coughs> so assembling. Since you all use these, it's nice to probably go through how to put it together properly. So the first thing that you'll do is take your special needs teeth and you put it through the collar. Now these teats come in two sizes. So we've just we've um, we've got a neonate, which is a much smaller teat for those neonate um, babies. <coughs> then you'll put the vacuum. Um, so sorry, the um, the valve membrane onto the teat. We need it to look this way. So we want bumps inwards. and then attach it to your um, container. Squeeze, and that, what that does is it allows the milk to create a vacuum and it goes into here. And, and just avoid squeezing too much milk into the teeth, especially at the, at the, when they're starting to get used to these, um, these feeders. And then to clean, so disassemble all parts. Warm, uh, wash with... Um, uh, Warm water, then wash all parts with warm soapy water. Don't turn the teats inside out. I've had a few hospitals that have done that and put their fingers straight through it. You don't need to do that. Just give it a really good squeeze at the top and then dry all parts on the clean cloth. We've done this one. Isn't a beautiful picture? And then the last but not least, oh, that's not what. Um, so we're just going to quickly touch base for five, ten minutes on contact nipple shields and some tips and tricks. So a few of you have got a contact nipple shield. They've been circulated around. Now how many of you have seen a mum that's been given a contact nipple shield and said, stick this on, put this on? And mums will often go, and it falls off. Yeah? Has everyone seen that? Yeah. So the way that these are supposed to be put on is if we press on the top, so the harder part on the actual top of the contact nipple shield, and we push it down, and we roll them up, so it's almost like a little sombrero, you can see, like that, yeah? And then, so it's like that, and then with your thumb, or your finger, your mum will get her to put her thumb or finger on, you put the finger over the holes, so it's like this, like that. Put your finger over the holes. And then when she puts this on her nipple and she flips it out, the vacuum will help pull that nipple into the contact nipple shield so it won't just flop off. Now, what's really, 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 really good is if mum gets a little bit of EBM, so hands express a little bit, and puts some um, breast milk on the inside to help 
want to cure it in place, but also for that infant to then be able to smell and go, oh, I know what this is about. Okay? So flip it like this. So this, this little cutout, yeah. most of it to nose. So babies can sort of smell. I've heard of people saying, oh no, put it in so it stimulates mum, but it's, it's nose. I actually heard something that doesn't matter. There you go. Apparently it doesn't matter. Yeah. I'll love to mix your way. Okay. So sizing. Um, I, I had the absolute pleasure of meeting a researcher who looks into the use of breast of contact nipple shields. And she said one of the most important aspects of contact nipple shields is making sure mums are sized properly. Now, if she is a medium in a contact nipple shield, does not mean that she's going to be a medium in a breast shield or vice versa. They look at different measurements. The contact nipple shield is about... Sorry? Yeah, so the contact nipple shield, you look at the base of the nipple and make sure that that fits the base with a little bit of a gap. Any other questions? <laughs> no? Beautiful. Now there's some... Where are they gone? There are some um, infographics on how to put these on and start, um, get mums to put them on too if you need them. All right. I'll pass over to the lovely child health nurses. Thank you. Just take my stick out for you. Did you want to use this? Um, I will actually. Yeah, that's okay. So that, that is to move forward, and that's point out. Yeah. So I'm going to move the wrong thing. Yeah. Okay. I'll we'll see how it goes. And then do I just press? Just, do I just point? click it anyway? Oh, okay. Cool. Oh, that's, that's a clicker. Yeah. Oh, clicker. <laughs> so we're to go to the next song. Yes. Okay, good afternoon everybody. So being aware most health professionals here today work in the acute sector, can you hear me? Uh, Hang on, I'll just um, turn the volume up, if you like, seeing you're standing yeah. away from it. Oh, I can't get me closer. Okay. <laughs> um, volume. Hello? Oh. Is that better? Uh, being aware most health professionals here today work in the acute sector, we have tried to showcase sh child youth and family health services through pictures. So those who are not familiar with our service can visualise our work throughout the presentation today. We will first start with a photo from the past. Um, actually, before I move on to that photo, I just wanted to, for those that don't know where child youth and family health are or what we look like, 
when you first came, come to the foyer of where we are, this is the beautiful murals that you'll be um, met with. Um, and that's just the outside of the building as well. Okay. So Queensland celebrated 100 years of child health nursing last year in 2018. Historically, child health nursing has evolved from a time when infant mortality rates saw one in nine Queensland infants dying before their first birthday. This was the trigger for the specialised area of child, youth of child health nursing. These photos of the past capture the essence of child health nursing that still exists today. But the purpose of child health nursing has and continues to evolve. Child health nursing plays a key role in identifying the bio, psycho, social factors that are known to impact on parenting. Nurturing an infant in the early years has a decisive and long-lasting impact on how children develop, their capacity to learn, their behaviour and the ability to regulate their emotions and risks of disease later in life. I would like to thank Karen, Melinda and Nikki for inviting Child Youth and Health um, Services to speak today. So Donna and I are both clinical nurses at Child, Youth and Family Health. Um, Donna is also the face of Child Health in her dual position as the hospital liaison nurse on the maternity unit and I am the newly appointed lactation consultant um, in the neonatal unit. Oh, you can see in these photos as well, they're not specifically from Queensland or Townsville. They're just, I just wanted to, um, you know, capture the age range of, as well of, of what we um, see as child health nurses. So even though infant mortality rates have improved over the last 100 years, child development and parenting support is still the focus of child health nursing today. The AEDC data tells us that one in five children starting their first year of school have developmental delays in one or more domains. So when we're talking about domains, we're looking at a physical, so fine, out, fine and gross motor, social emotional, problem solving and speech and language. If developmental delays or parenting concerns are identified earlier in a child's life and interve intervention is provided, short and long-term educational and health outcomes will be improved for these children. From a child health nursing perspective, we would like to see all children aged zero to five attend their scheduled well child health checks. These well child health checks are found in your personal health record book or otherwise known as the Red Book. Contact visits between families and child health professionals are recommended as part of the minimum standards for conducting evidence-based early detection. So during these scheduled well child health checks, head to, head to toe assessments are completed as well as as well as a discussion on age-related topics, and this would include breastfeeding. Um, and as the child grows, then you would talk about the introduction to solids. So just looking at the graph, you can see, and as everyone um, knows from today and before, I'm sure, that um, so within the first six months, obviously the breast milk provides all the energy and nutrients needed for that child. Um, in the second half of the year, breast milk provides 50%. So that's when you introduce your complementary foods um, and appropriate com complementary foods as well. So that will um, you know, ensure the child is not going hungry and not being under, uh, um, what's the word? Uh, under, undernourished, yes. Um, and then the second year of life, um, that breast milk is, uh, will provide about a third of the, um, child's energy and nutrition needs. So this graph, um, even though it's from 2010, I actually found this from the Australian National Breastfeeding Strategy 2019 and beyond, 
which is a very recent document. But when I chatted with um, Christy last night as well, I guess you could say the numbers are still relatively the same. Um, so with initiation of breastfeeding, so this is exclusive breastfeeding, you're looking at around 90% for non-Indigenous. And then I had stats obviously there going down to 16% as well at six months. So I think they're elevated just a little bit now, Christy, as well. Yeah. 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 And then, yeah. And then with um, the Indigenous, obviously, that's lower as well. So I guess, um, and, and I like to show that because I like, I like numbers and I like data, but I think graphs is a really nice way of simplifying it as well. And also I understand that there's a lot of health professionals in here today that probably are aware of this, but also for the new health professionals, it's really nice to have a, like a national perspective of what's going on in the breastfeeding space. And I think it also just really allows you to understand, especially in the Towns of Hospital and Health Service, how we have the BFHI, and then that means why, again, why it's so important for us to have those 10 steps for successful breastfeeding as well. Because if you look at those stats, it's really not that great. Okay. Oh, and now, oh, have I? Yes, that came, that came around quickly. Now it's Donna's turn to talk. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Michelle. Um, firstly, I'd like to talk about one of the main programs we run at Child Health, and that's our Mums and Bubs Home Visiting Program. So all mothers, regardless of whether they birth at the Townsville Hospital or the Mater, are offered a home visit when their babies are two weeks old and then again at four weeks. Uh, in 2018, our stats showed that we home visited 96% of families in Townsville with newborns. So when you look at those stats, um, that tells you why it's one of our biggest programs. So looking at the slides there, in the top one, um, that's actually one of our nurses, Karen, as she's carrying some baby scales walking in to do a home visit. So. Typically, we're known as the baby nurse just coming to weigh baby. And while that's important and certainly um, something that we do do, these visits are about, about much more than weighing baby. So at the two-week visit, um, we do the zero to four-week growth and development check in the red book. So this is the one of the well child checks that Michelle spoke about earlier. Um, this includes weighing and measuring, obviously, the baby, as well as doing a top-to-toe assessment. So this is um, just looking at bub. It's also talking to mum about any concerns she might have with breastfeeding, baby's weight. So it's really important if we can provide support and address any of her concerns at that time. This visit, um, we also orientate parents to the Red Book. So we talk about the importance of those growth and development checks. Um, we really like parents to think of these as normal, so not coming when they think there's a problem, but rather coming as a normal part of just checking in. That way delays can be picked up early. And the growth chart in the Red Book. So showing parents where their babies are at on the graph can be really encouraging for parents to see how they're tracking and obviously just showing their growth, just especially if they're doubting you know, their milk supply or whatever. Um, we also talk about some of the services or all the services we offer, so especially um, the satellite clinics and um, our new baby group, which I'll go on to talk about shortly in more detail. So parents' expectations of how things are going to be when they bring their baby home can be often very different to the reality. This baby that they thought would just feed and sleep may be slightly unsettled and 
more than likely just displaying normal newborn behaviour. So much of the time, especially if this is their first baby, we do a lot of reassuring and just normalising in that first visit that we do. Another really important element to this visit is um, just overall seeing how mum and baby are both travelling. So um, looking at mum's interaction with the baby, uh, there may be already documented um, something, you know, you might note some issues with maternal mood or this might become evident throughout the visit, any social issues. So if we can, we try and um, just approach those subjects and explore those issues and provide support. So this may be offering a, another visit. Um, it may be linking her in with her GP if she's not already linked in, or it may be just referral to uh, one of our targeted programs such as our EIPC or our family care program. So this is our front information page and I know that many of you will be familiar with this page. Um, it goes, it's, it's the insert that goes into the baby's red book. I'd just like to also mention this page was created by one of our nurses a few years ago and um, it's since been, off, been adopted by other child health centres throughout Queensland. It provides an easy reference for parents to see what we offer and our contact details. Along the bottom there is a quick reference also for those well child checks as well as um, immunisations and when they're due. So I'm just going to go through them um, briefly. Up the top, that's our intake line. So this is our main switch number. Parents can ring this number. Um, they can speak to a child health nurse for advice or support. Many of our referrals come through intake. If it's after hours, we ask that parents ring the 13 Health number. Our home visiting program, so I just spoke about, this is a two and four week visit. Um, we try and arrange visits geographically so that we do certain areas of town on certain days of the week. Our growth and development clinic, <coughs> so this is for zero to five year olds. Um, at Kerwin by appointment. Our satellite drop-in clinics, they're listed there. Every day of the week there's a satellite clinic somewhere in Townsville apart from Sunday. So these clinics enable parents to bring their baby for a way and a measure and, and they don't, if they just want to talk and get some advice, speak to a nurse, um, that's available too. It provides easy access in the suburbs to just continue to monitor their growth and development. Immunisation, so we have immunisation Mondays and Thursdays at uh, Kerwin and Wednesdays at North Ward and again this is no appointment needed, parents just come in the time frame. Our new baby groups, so these are held at Kerwin as well as North Ward throughout the year. They run for four consecutive weeks for babies up to three months of age. Generally, groups number about 10 to 12. Um, they're very informal. And although topics are set out each week, we really encourage um, that interaction. And often, topic, the topic of the group may be driven by concerns that the parents have on that particular week. So these groups provide an opportunity for parents to meet other parents with babies around the same age. Townsville is one of those places that um, often families are here without very much support. So this, and if, especially if mothers have gone from working uh, to being at home with a baby, it can be very isolating. Many of those who attend these groups go on to form lifelong friendships. Our lactation clinic, so I'm not going to speak about this because I know Michelle's going to go on about it, um, talk about it more soon. Our imps day stay. So 
Our day stays are held at the M Centre at Kerwin Campus. A, a referral is required. So parent, these are for, it's for parents who are struggling, um, needing support. They're able to come and spend the day one-on-one -on -one with a child health nurse. It allows time to observe and explore any issues that may be uh, causing concern <coughs> while providing guidance and support. Often this day is about normalising and providing reassurance. And our Triple P, this is um, our positive parenting program. So as most of us know, parenting can be one of the most challenging jobs on the planet. Unfortunately, there's no manual and we often parent the way we were parented because that's all we know. So Triple P provides parents with insight into why children might be behaving the way they are and it teaches them strategies to deal with the behaviour in a positive way. Um, Triple P can be either by one-on-one -on -one appointment or in an eight-week group. And all of our nurses who run the Triple P or run the Triple P groups um, are Triple P accredited. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, often. So the question was about referral to day stay. Um, so yes, so many of our referrals come. They may come through intake, um, then through a child health nurse. So we we like mums who want to come and do a day stay to have a clinic appointment first. Um, so we actually see what's going on and then we can do the referral. Sometimes the referral is done over the phone, but mostly we like them to have a clinic appointment and then come in and do a day stay. Yeah. Um, okay, I thought I'd just clar clarify to everyone as well the difference between the acute sector and the community in regards to the IVCLC or lactation consultants. So as we all know here at the hospital we've got the lactation consultants in maternity ward as well as um, in neonatal unit. In the, uh, sorry, in the community it, it, it's a little bit different because they've actually got five IVCLC or lactation consultants um, but they're not actually employed as lactation consultants, they're employed as child health nurses. So all the nurses that work over at Kerwin or Child, Youth and Family Health are actually child health nurses. So that's why when you know, um, you're looking at why aren't we open you know, for a lactation clinic every day, um, it's because we've got all the programs that we do employed as a child health nurse. So I just thought I'd make that clear because I know sometimes like, oh, you can never get into a lactation appointment. But the other option is, is that we've also, the fact that we are child health nurses and we do home visits or we are an intake, there's always, there's always a possibility that you're actually going to be seen by a lactation consultant as well. So, um, so it's best always just to ring and see, see what we can do because you certainly want to see the mums if they want to be seen by a lactation consultant. Um, so... If a mum does come and see us, this is where they'll go to the IMPS building or the Infant Management and Parenting Services, oh, sorry, it's Skills um, building. So it's just been recently renovated because it celebrated its 20 year um, birthday. So if you're coming in to see a lactation consultant, that'll be on a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning. And they're just morning appointments, um, so from 8 to 12 o'clock and they're one hour appointments as well. So the thing about the IMPS building, it, it's a very much a home-like environment. There's nothing clinical about it. So in this building, this is where we also hold our groups. So um, the Triple P, Circle of Security, um, and also have the day stay as well. Um, for mums to, as Donna said, mums just ring in through intake as well. Um, usually they speak to a nurse and we can book them into the next available appointment. And I've just got there other reasons to send mums over to us or refer mums over to us is that they don't have to pay for parking, it's free. Um, <laughs> that's a big... Um, the reason I say that is because we've had mums come in and that's been, oh, I didn't know I could come here because 
it's so much easier in a sense. Having said that, I understand that there's sometimes some follow-up with the um, acute sector as well, but also know that um, we can access, obviously, the patient's notes and see what the problem was, what strategies have been um, suggested, and then follow up from that as well. And it's just easily accessed off the Arangau Drive as well. And it's free. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing also um, is that ABA actually come and use the IMPS group room as well. And I think that's, is it every second Wednesday morning? Yeah, yeah. So I just thought I'd put here some common reasons why mums are actually um, accessing the lactation consultants in the community. Um, and obviously the role of the lactation consultants here in the hospital is very much about that establishing that supply as well. There is a little bit of overlap of um, areas, but just for your interest, I thought I'd just share this with you. So you've got your general breastfeeding advice and support, so normalisation reassurance, low supply or perceived low supply, slow infant weight gain, lact um, latching difficulties, damaged or painful nipples, so tongue ties, lip ties, high palate, flat and inverted nipples, engorgement, mastitis, nipple and ductal thrush, and the discontinued, discontinued use of um, nipple shields as well, and just occasionally the relactation or the va uh, nipple vasospasm, which was talked about earlier today. And then in the older babies, a slowed weight gain, reduced milk supply and returning to work or weaning advice as well. So this is, um, I'm trying to kind of cover everything that we do over at Child House. So this is now just focusing on the parenting aspect as well. So with this survey, this was um, conducted between November 2008 Six, oh, sorry, 15 and January 2016, and basically they interviewed around five, oh, sorry, 4,000 parents in Queensland. So you can see there's lots of numbers and stats there, but I just want to bring your attention to the red highlighted area, and this is specifically around parents accessing parenting support or going along to parenting education classes. So out of this 4,000 parents, only 17%, which work out to be just under 700, parents um, came along or used a parenting support group. But out of those 700, 93% of them said that it was actually very beneficial to them. So I thought that was quite interesting, knowing that we know there's lots of parents that find it quite difficult or struggle in those early days especially, but then ongoing when we see the toddlers and... And, and all those things as well. So, and I guess for us, we've talked about the groups that we <coughs> offer, so the Circle of Security and the Triple P. And I guess for us, parent outcomes that have been reported to us is that they do experience, having had attended a parenting support group, um, that they do experience less depression, anxiety, um, guilt, parent guilt, and anxiety, stress, anger, and also feel more confident in parenting as well. So this survey also revealed that it's actually doctors, teachers, nurses and midwives that are most commonly used sources of formal support. So that's one section, but then just below it, it actually talks about how seven in ten parents worry that they will be judged negatively if they come along to a parenting group. So this is why um, I think we really need to consider the language that we use when speaking to parents about seeking support because as stats show, the, the parents that actually access those groups do find it beneficial. But there seems to be a stigma that they're going to be judged negatively if they say, hey, I'm actually struggling here. Um, so I think we as health professionals are kind of like the meat and the sandwich that we can make a difference if we change the way that we speak. And I think a lot of the talking of the presentations that were done today is there's a flavour of that in that as well. So just to give an example of, the, of what we can do differently, I've just got this next slide and there's two statements. So basically... 
Research shows that if parents, parents will be more inclined to engage with health professionals if we speak from a child development perspective opposed to a parent struggling perspective. So I'm just going to put this first slide up, or first statement, and it's really interesting hearing Donna, she referred to um, parenting doesn't have a manual, and I think that's quite a common spiel that I have been known to use, um, and others as well. So babies don't come with a manual, but advice and support in the earliest weeks can help parents adjust to the life-changing responsibilities of a new baby. So I guess there's a, the element or the argument of that's normalising what life is, because it is going to be difficult and life-changing, but it also very much focuses on the parent and their struggle. And if you think of parents that maybe already struggle in everyday life without having a baby, and now they've got a baby as well, how that can be quite overwhelming for them. And then knowing that seven out of 10 parents actually don't put their hand up to say, I'm struggling, it kind of leaves them in no man's land <laughs> and they can be kind of spinning their wheels and going nowhere. And yeah, so that's just one statement. And then the other one to compare it to is more of a child development perspective. So healthy child development starts early and babies' brains are being built from the very first days. The interactions you have with your baby and the relationship you develop, even in the first few weeks, will help them grow and thrive. Obviously, this is a lot wordier, um, but I'm hoping you can see the difference in what I'm getting at. The reason why you want parents to come along to parenting groups is actually for the benefit of the child. So if we make the focus more about the child and what we can do to help them develop, as a parent, that kind of comes next. So it kind of takes the focus off the parent and more about the child. So this is just planting a seed and raising awareness. Um, and I don't have the correct spiel to say in every situation, but maybe going forward you can think about that and maybe just tweak what you're saying to parents and or especially mothers, I guess, that you're coming across in your work. So this research was also done, and I've got it from down, um, down below where I referenced it from, that the public thinks child development happens to older children and young children just simply grow. So both nature and nurture, so genes and environment, influence children's development. The quality of a child's earliest environments and the availability of appropriate experiences at the right stages of development are crucial factors in how a child's brain will develop. So to give an example of this, um, so scenario one, say you're on a home visit, you go into the home, the baby's in the cot on one side of the room, the baby's awake on her back, um, and mother's on the other side. So this baby's not having any interaction, the baby's not being stimulated at all, um, and then when the baby cries, the mother comes over, picks the baby up, feeds the baby, then puts the baby back in the cot and walks away, even though the baby is awake. So then you go into your next home visit and you see a mum in a house that's got the baby close to her. She's talking to the baby, smiling at the baby. You've got eye contact happening. Um, she's physically close with the baby. She's able to read those baby's cues of tired or hunger or just showing delight. Um, puts the baby down for a little bit of tummy time, sees that the baby's not happy, picks the baby up, feeds the baby, um, and just really comforting and keeps the baby on her during the consult. So you can just see in those two scenarios, that's just one moment in time of each of those <coughs> children's lives if you think developmentally, how much more the brain is being stimulated by the scenario two opposed to scenario one. Um, and that's, yeah. So, so babies are working really hard to communicate with us. They are born ready to learn and have many skills to learn over many years. 
Play is an essential part of brain development that can help babies or toddlers' brains develop. It is in the experiences and relationships that infants and young children have that continuously develop their brains. So this is why in terms of low internal mood, disengagement, separation of mother from the infant, or the impact of mental health disorders, leaves the developing brain of the infant at risk. Exposure to stress and trauma can have long-term negative consequences for the brain's development, um, whereas the smiling, talking, engaging, the physical contact um, can stimulate the brain growth. Caring and supportive environments that promote optimal early childhood development greatly increase children's chances of a successful transition to school. This means children are socially, emotionally and physically ready for school. Um, in turn promotes children's chances of achieving better learning outcomes while at school, better education, employment and health will they, uh, after they have finished school. So child health nurses are in a position to talk to parents about how they can support their child's development uh, in meeting those expected milestones. So the focus of child health nursing is, uh, is on how children develop, what supports them, them to develop, and how parenting impacts on this. Okay. We would like to end with this quote from the Raising Children's website as a reminder that children do not come alone and it is through working in partnership with the parents we can improve the health outcomes of children. So. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, were there any questions? Oh, also, I'd like to say there's actually a few other child health nurses in the audience today. And I would like them to stand up, just in case you do have any questions during afternoon tea, you could certainly go to them as well. <laughs> we, I, don't, I don't think we're going to have afternoon tea. I think oh, we're just okay, going to plod along. Okay. Because we've got Did one more session, hi? I think. So there's okay. a child health nurses there as well. Yeah, okay. So just before you sit down... Oh. So Donna and Michelle, I'd just like to say thank you for um, coming up and speaking. Um, today, and um, just to show our appreciation. Thank you very much. So, um, hopefully, uh, we've got a bigger insight into what happens out at Child Health. Thank you. So, will we do? Will we just, it's on my final minute. I'm guessing a few of you would like to finish up early. Who would like an early mark? Yeah. yeah? All right. So, what I might do then is I'll do the cleaning of kits. Um, now and then rather than going for a break and then we can finish up after I'm finished and I'll make it nice. Sure. So is everyone okay? Yep. Perfect. Oh, can you sign me in? Alrighty, so Queensland Health won't allow me to use YouTube, which is always a way, especially when you use the word breast, Everything, the whole system melts down, so unfortunately I can't show you the video. We've got five minutes, I promise I'll only take five more minutes. So there's some other tools um, for making sure that mums are sized properly. So you know how we were talking earlier about the correct use with the breast pumps? So there's two things that tend to go wrong with pumping. The first one is a mum that's incorrectly sized, and the other one is a desperate mum who cranks the breast pump up thinking, oh, I'll get more volume, 
And in fact, what actually happens is both of these prevent, the, they cause pain, and pain causes the release of stress hormones and pain hormones, so things like cortisol and adrenaline and those sorts of things. Now, as cave women, we were never designed to be breastfeeding our baby in a beautiful, lovely environment when the big scary bear was coming our way. The whole system with oxytocin shuts down. And so, as you know now from all the presentations today, oxytocin is really important for that milk ejection. And that's why we always say that mums need to be nice and comfortable when they're expressing. So sizing is really, really, really important. The visualizer thingy here, apparently. Oh, there's a visualizer thingy. Ooh. So straight away, can you see the difference between these two funnels? There's huge difference. Massive, massive difference. We were not designed to try and squish a large nipple into something like this and say vice versa. Can you keep talking? Can I keep talking? I'll keep talking, keep yattering. Um, now, what can happen is if a mother who's got a larger nipple is... We, we put her um, nipple into a smaller funnel... The rubbing that can occur can cause nipple trauma, especially after a couple of pumping sessions. You marry that up with a mother that's desperate and she's cranking up a breast pump, it's a recipe for disaster. And it's so, so easily, oh, look at this, so easily avoided. Oh, this is so exciting. I've never had this before. Ooh. I'm glad that you went wrong. <laughs> right, so what we don't want to see is a nipple rubbing on the side. So you can see how white it is. That's really, 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 really bad. Um, and what can happen is after a while, that nipple trauma and that, that friction can actually cause that, that damage. What we also don't want to see, and I can show it on my lovely little pu prepubescent nipple, <laughs> so tiny, um, is you don't want to see areola being pulled in. So you don't want to see this area ever rubbing on the inside of the funnel. Rubbing is a big no-no. We don't want to see that. So the way that we size mothers is we can use this particular ruler. And you see here, the ruler here, is you will measure from the base of the nipple to the top of the nipple. So this tiny, tiny little one's only 10 millimetres. Lovely. Cute little nipples. And then you'll use that millimetre to work out what size. So Medela have got five sizes. The small and the extra, extra large are reusable. The other three, the medium, the large, and the extra large come in your kits. Which are these ones. Now I know that I've just been told that in a few places there's only mediums available. Which is a little bit scary. So I'm going to get you some larges and some extra larges for the ward, and then we'll make a plan. There's no cost difference between them, and it makes sense we try to make sure that all mums are catered for. Now, on here, can everyone see this QR code? This is the video link that I was trying to tell you about. It is a fabulous tool to show mums that they will take a photo of this, and they go to a YouTube video, and they can see what a normal expression should be like. So there's no rubbing, and we see the base of the nipple is anchored so that that way there's no pulling of that nipple or pulling of the areola into the funnel. Ipswich Hospital now routinely do that every time they have a special care mum that's pump dependent. They show the mum what they should and shouldn't see, especially for those women that do not want to show you what's going on when they're expressing, because some women in some cultures will not want... You're looking while they're expressing, but we'll say what's oh, so sore. Any questions at all with um, expressing? So please um, have a look at this video. It's really, really great at, um, at showing what you should and shouldn't see. Now, cleaning. I'm going to open a set. <laughs> so cleaning a one-day kit, and they're supposed to be used for 24 hours, or eight pumps. So on the back, oh, I like this tool, it's very good, isn't it? So on the back here, can you see these boxes? So you can get mums to tick how often they've 
they've used that set. They've got to have good compliance. If you don't think you're going to get compliance, stick with the day. So your parts of your kit that you need to clean are only these two. Just the funnel and just the connector. We don't clean this. Clean up my workspace. So we don't clean this, but we're gonna clean these two. Now to clean the connector, everyone see the, the membrane? That needs to be removed properly. Because what can happen, especially that colostrum that's lovely and thick and viscous like honey, can get stuck. And to do that, mums will take that off like that. Give it a really thorough clean. And to clean them, it's warm water. So once everything's been taken apart, it's warm water and then clean with warm soapy water, rinse and leave to dry. You don't need to use a bottle brush if you've taken all the parts apart properly. Okay, some last tips and tricks. Now how we were talking about before with volumes, does everybody know that you can hold this upside down? Yeah, fabulous. Make sure you've got a bottle handy and ready because some mums will start having these beautiful big letdowns and be like, oh, stop, 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 stop. Let's put a bottle on, turn it round and then express again. Yes? You don't need to put... You don't need to... No! That's correct. So the beauty... And I love Medela for doing this because um, what you can do is... So this is how you'll set it up. And you get mums to sit there. Come around the front. Can everyone see me? If I stand on my tippy toes. So mums can hold this upside down and then the droplets of colostrum will go into, the, into here. And how easy is that to then take off and just get those couple of droplets or though you know half a mil but it's really important to have a bottle handy because if suddenly she goes oh i'm flipping awesome at this and then she has a big letdown you've got to um, make sure that, you, that um yeah you've got backup just in case but this is really empowering you know how we're talking about how mum's mental health is and how important that that really is for her breastfeeding the other thing then is then she can transition to, and I'll get you some of these colostrum containers. So colostrum containers, so what Ipswich do um, is they use this as a, if a mum is still using this at day two, well, we're probably not getting enough volumes. This is a visual reminder. Hang on, we might just need to check in with mum. Because these only go up to, um, they're about 35 mil. And then from there, then she can progress onto one of the 80 mil. This has got the same volume in it. Looks huge, doesn't it? A massive difference. So it's a transition. So that to that, and then your bottle. And that's it. Any last questions? No? Beautiful. Thanks, everybody. So just before you go, we have some evaluation sheets. Hopefully, hopefully everyone's got one. If you could just um, <laughs> drop it off over there near Nikki, that would be much appreciated. And there's also a certificate. If you've, oh, yep, if you've signed in, um, there's a certificate. Also, we would just like to thank Adele and Christy for coming up today and um, presenting this wonderful education session. We have learnt so much. We are going to get Neil to put it onto a server so that you can access it. Um, I will attempt to do that tomorrow and let people know. So um, hopefully if there's anyone who you've, you know, anyone who hasn't been today, they can access it as well. So let people know how good today was. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>